the Airbus A350, the most advanced commercial aircraft in the world. Its construction, nothing short of a masterpiece, on the grand scale and down to the smallest detail. Two and a half million components, 1,800 professionals for the final assembly alone. Together, constructing an aircraft the likes of which the world has never seen before. The goal, minimal fuel consumption, maximum range, the product of precision workmanship, expertise, and quite simply, pride. And all this is only possible thanks to perfect mega manufacturing. Toulouse, France, the headquarters of Europe's largest aircraft manufacturer. In Blagnac, Airbus workers construct the most advanced passenger aircraft in the world, the Airbus A350. One o'clock in the afternoon, one of the fleet of Beluga transport aircraft arrives with a delivery of components, so-called because its shape resembles that of the white whale. It is key to the construction process, a 1,500 cubic meter cargo compartment and a 47 metric ton payload. An entire fuselage section of the A350 fits in the belly of a single beluga. Or, as in this case, one of its wings. Measuring 32 meters in length, it would be practically impossible to build the A350 without the beluga fleet. Baptiste Ronet must see to it that his team unloads all the freight within an hour. Every delay triggers a chain reaction, disrupting construction of the world's most advanced passenger aircraft. Unloading the unique Beluga Super Transporters is Baptiste's dream job. I'm very proud of our Beluga fleet. They're key to the entire assembly operation running smoothly. I've loved planes since childhood. My father and my grandfather worked at Airbus. Our family has always been fascinated with aviation. The Beluga fleet flies wings, fuselage sections, cabin furnishing, and vertical tailplanes for the A350 from around Europe to these assembly hangars in Toulouse. 4,500 suppliers and 12 Airbus facilities are involved in its production. The background behind this complex puzzle? Airbus was established in the 1960s as a consortium of companies from across the European continent. Different locations have different areas of expertise to this day. Of particular importance to the production of the A350 are the sites in France, Spain, Germany, and Great Britain. The nose and midsection come from the Saint-Nazaire plant, the tail section from Hamburg. The wings are manufactured in Broughton and Bremen, the horizontal tailplane in Getafe. All of these shipments must be perfectly coordinated. Head of the unit, Nabil Tahiri. It's our job to ensure that all the parts are transported on time. We have to always make sure that all of the components are on hand here. Thanks to our fleet of transport aircraft, we can get anything that's missing here straight away. We need around three hours to pick up a part from anywhere inside Europe. The Beluga provides us with an extremely quick and safe way of getting all the parts we need in a timely manner. Our system is absolutely reliable. Even when everything is running smoothly, the A350 still has to go through seven stations. With 120 aircraft a year, this demands absolute perfection. Everything begins in Station 59. The first stage of the final assembly line. Around 40 workers fit out the fuselage with the large components of the passenger cabin, such as the galley and washrooms, 
Nine such fuselage segments can be worked on in parallel here. Responsible for this work is Francois-Louis Godin. He oversees each machine for 80 days, from the first assembly step to completion. This is where assembly begins. The sections of the A350's fuselage arrive here from all over Europe. We work on outfitting the passenger cabin from the very first station to the last station. What makes this assembly line unique is that we fit out the passenger cabin and assemble the aircraft in parallel. This change to the workflow allows us to minimize production time. Six thirty in the morning. Team briefing at the start of the shift. Fifteen workers, mostly electricians and installation technicians, divide up the day's tasks amongst themselves. They have to install the galleys, washrooms, and crew rest compartments. Any special requests from the airlines are incorporated here too. The outfitting work is performed on all fuselage sections and shifts. This way, no team has to wait for another. In the tail section of a future A350, two workers make preparations for the installation of the galley. Assembly instructions individually pack screws. It all resembles a bit like a flat pack wardrobe from a furniture store. It's not as simple as it looks. It's very different to screwing together an IKEA bookshelf. That would be great, but it isn't like that, unfortunately. It takes highly trained craftsmen. Even the smallest of installations can affect the safety of the finished aircraft. As such, special expertise is required for every single operation. It takes months and often years to train our workers. In contrast with a cupboard from a furniture store, it's critical that nothing can shift, even during the most severe turbulence. No screw may fail, a big responsibility for the workers. just as it is for the quality inspectors in the adjacent fuselage section. They have to first approve the delivered fuselages for outfitting. But only if every bulkhead, every electrical component, and even the floor is free of defects. The supplier has already ultrasonically inspected it for damage on departure. But a lot could have happened during transport, and nothing can be left to chance. The next fuselage has already been released. Craftsmen seal the floor where the lavatory will later be installed. The film prevents moisture from penetrating the floor. Like everywhere in the aircraft, there are electrical cables there too. And there are more of them in the high-tech A350 than in most other commercial aircraft. There are instructions for every task. Each worker must double check that the work has been performed to the exacting standard. In the first hangar, the teams install components that would no longer fit through the doors once the fuselage is assembled. A resting cabin for the pilots arrives. The Airbus crew installs it behind the cockpit and above the galley. The A350 is a long-haul airliner. It can fly non-stop for up to 20 hours. There are several pilots on board for such flights who take it in turns to rest. Work on the fuselage sections continues without a break. They are, after all, expected to fly away soon. Next up is Station 50 of the final assembly line. The fuselage sections are now ready for their big moment, the so-called marriage. Waiting at Station 50 are Deputy Unit Head Arnaud Herry and Team Manager Wilfried Martin. They have the nose section for an A350 maneuvered into the hangar. Arnaud has worked at Airbus for 16 years and on the A350 final assembly line for six of these. The aircraft is very popular. Over 250 of them have been delivered to date. And there are orders for a further 890 on the books. With this number of outstanding orders, 
every stage of production is subject to an extremely strict timetable. Because of the number of parts that have to be assembled to build an aircraft and the large number of subcontractors, partners and factories that supply them to us, there are a whole host of risk factors. We often have to set priorities in order to ensure that the aircraft arrives at the next station on time. We sometimes allow work that has not yet been finished to be completed at the next station. Our overriding priority is to avoid at all costs the next station being prevented from continuing with the assembly work. Once the nose section is in place, the transport operator maneuvers the middle section into the hangar. Both sections are already equipped with lines for the hydraulic, water, oxygen, and air conditioning systems. They are already insulated, and wiring harnesses are installed under the ceiling. The tail section waits in front of the hangar. In the case of the A350-1000, the three fuselage sections together measure 73.8 meters in length, seven meters more than the shorter version. The operators align the fuselage sections with a tenth of a millimeter precision before they join them together with around 40,000 fasteners. As with the rest of the construction, most of this work is performed by hand. Over 10,000 rivets hold the carbon fiber fuselage sections together. No other aircraft uses such a high proportion of carbon fiber as the A350. Because the material is extremely hard, the workers have to use especially high quality drilling equipment. 53% of the A350 is composed of carbon composite. It's 40% lighter than aluminum and allows much more complex shapes. Each layer consists of super thin plies of carbon fiber embedded in a synthetic resin matrix. And there are several layers, a process that takes a few days. In the aviation industry, composites are viewed as the materials of the future and are increasingly replacing aircraft aluminum. The aircraft is fitted with its iconic nose gear at this station, all in parallel with the myriad other processes taking place. This component alone is constructed from around a thousand parts, primarily made from high tensile steel. It too is installed by hand. Every connection is bonded and bolted for safety. Following installation, the workers check the functionality of the landing gear. It's activated by remote control instead of the pilot pressing a button. The nose wheel must deploy at the same speed it would during approach. The nose gear is now operational. The A350 fuselage must again switch hangers to be fitted with its main landing gear. The workers hydraulically lower the 32-ton fuselage to rest on its support wheels. The boat. A big moment. The fuselage of the wide-body jet will soon leave the hangar in one piece. Malgré toutes les routines, Despite the routine, you're always learning something new whether at a personal, technical, or organizational level. You start each day in good spirits, 
happy to be building these amazing cutting-edge products. It requires total dedication at all times from everyone. The massive fuselage rests on its wheels for the first time, and everyone holds their breath. The operator of the aircraft tractor grabs the nose wheel to carefully push it out of the hangar, just like maneuvering around the airport. After being joined up at Station 50, the cigar, as it's affectionately known, continues on its journey. A cigar is what an assembled fuselage without wings is called in aviation jargon. These will be fitted at the next station. The next hangar, known as Station 40, can accommodate four cigars at the same time. They'll be almost complete aircraft when they leave. The aircraft will be 90% finished when it leaves this station. Wings, main landing gear, tail assembly. The specialists here attach everything visibly missing from the outside of the aircraft. To maintain efficiency, Several teams work in parallel at this station, too. A crane lifts the wing into position that will later support the aircraft in flight. The 32-meter long and 6-meter wide wings are the largest aircraft components ever to be fabricated from carbon fiber composite material. The wings of the A350 are something very special. Their development was painstaking and contained over 4,000 hours of wind tunnel testing. Positioning them is an incredible feat, too. Several thousand rivets will now keep the wings attached to the fuselage at speeds of up to 960 kilometers per hour. Flap design is optimized to reduce vortex generation, resulting in better lift efficiency and improved low speed performance, while reducing aerodynamic generated noise from the wing. A special droop nose is integrated into the inboard wing leading edge. It helps the aircraft remain flyable even at low air speeds. This facilitates takeoff and landing. Like the wing, the horizontal tailplane of the A350 is made from carbon, too. It has a span of 19 meters and was manufactured in Getafe, Spain. As with the fuselage segments and the wings, all of the electrical and hydraulic systems have already been installed. The vertical tailplane comes from Stade in Germany. It's the only component that is painted prior to installation due to its eventual height. The main landing gear of the A350-1000 consists of two six-wheel bogies. During landing, it has to support a weight of up to 233 metric tons. Following installation, Florent Cubereau and his colleagues connect the hydraulic lines that control the landing gear. A combination of adhesive and bolts is used here as well. Florent hasn't always worked on landing gear. He used to be a bricklayer before he applied for a job at Airbus. I come from Toulouse. Airbus is the biggest employer here, and they started this new program with the A350. 
They were recruiting workers, so I decided to try my luck at Airbus. After the interviews, I was given training and passed the exams. Then I was assigned here to Station 40. Airbus is not only the biggest employer in Toulouse, aircraft construction is pretty much a part of the regional identity here. The scale of the facility is truly impressive. 23,000 people work for Airbus in the hangars and offices surrounding Toulouse Blagnac Airport. They work five days a week in two shifts. Lunchtime is staggered. The early shift workers go to lunch first, then the office staff. The cooks, working in the 15 restaurants around the factory site, prepare 2.6 million meals each year, handling 13.5 tons of steak and 10.5 tons of salad in the process. There are 20 company bus routes operating on the Airbus site. They transport 800,000 passengers each year. Anyone traveling to work with their own car can expect to be subject to strict controls. The site traffic monitoring service takes adherence to vehicle controls very seriously. No one is allowed to drive faster than 30 kilometers per hour. A white Renault, 43 kilometers per hour. Okay, understood, I'll intercept it. Those violating the traffic regulations risk losing permission to enter the site. Hello, sir. I'm from site security. Can you switch your engine off and show me your ID and parking permit, please? Another citation means suspension of the parking permit. You can use this to pick up your parking permit in eight days' time. You have to go to gate B to get it back. Have a good day, sir. Those who persistently violate the rules lose their permit permanently. Back at Station 40. Work continues after lunch, while wings, landing gear, and tail assembly are being mounted to the outside. Specialists are inside the plane, outfitting the cabin. Installing the cabin interior in parallel to assembling the aircraft is new. This change alone has reduced construction time by a third. Francois Louis, head of cabin installation, makes sure that there are no delays with the installation. We previously saw the start of assembly when the large components are installed. Everything that wouldn't fit through the cabin door later, once the fuselage is joined together. Here we're installing the so-called floor-to-floor. The wall lining, overhead compartments, and also the safety components, like the signals for cabin crew and passengers, and the overhead units that contain the oxygen masks. The cabin functions are regulated by a central control unit. In the A350, it ensures 20% higher air humidity and higher cabin pressure than has been usual until now, making it feel a lot closer to normal life on Earth. While the interior is being installed, a worker is in the cargo hold with a rag and brush, Cédric Cabarros. I have to clean this area here before I fix the insulating material in place. 
Whatever is underneath it will no longer be visible or accessible. Any residues like a metal swarf or other dirt that could be hidden behind it must be removed. Only when we're absolutely sure that this area is pristine can we lower the lining and fix in place the insulation between the exterior and interior of the aircraft. There are some traces here, for example. I use a cleaning cloth with a special solvent for this. There's something here too. Now I'm sure everything is clean and I can close up the insulation. The big moment for the entire team at Station 40 arrives. Their aircraft will rest entirely on its own wheels for the first time. Everything must be perfectly clean. No work residues, no drop of oil is allowed to contaminate the brand new aircraft or its tires. The workers activate the hydraulic system. They lower their over 100 ton creation. It's an emotional moment for everyone, including for Arnaud. You could say it's like the end of a pregnancy, a kind of birth. But there's a birth at a station every eight to nine days. Over time, that's an awful lot of babies. There's a part of us in every plane. We all put a lot of energy and dedication into our work. It makes us very happy to have done our bit. Arnaud's colleagues check the tire pressure under the load of the aircraft's weight. The aircraft is about 90% finished. It's time to bid farewell to Station 40. The doors open for the station's latest offspring to enter the world. Building aircraft is a real pleasure and is something I'm proud of. This is matched by the great sense of responsibility we feel when later our families, our children or friends climb aboard. So we're committed to doing a perfect job every day, never overlooking anything and building aircraft of the highest quality. And it's true, you can't help being filled with a certain pride each time you see one of these huge machines flying away. Everything is ready for the big moment. The openings in the machine are covered to protect against rain before the aircraft is moved to the next hangar. This new A350 will soon be flying for China's Southern Airlines. Millions of people will be putting their lives and their trust in the work performed by Arnaud Herry and his team. Two point five million individual parts are installed in an A three fifty when finished. And they all have to be present, of course. Not even one part can be missing.
Airbus gathers together the parts for its aircraft at two logistics centers. Stored on an area totaling 84,000 square meters, the equivalent of nearly 12 football fields, are aircraft parts and everything needed for the cabin interior, galley, overhead compartments, toilets, and seats. Fifty different airlines have ordered the A350. This means 50 different interiors for business, economy, and first class. The logistics specialists supply the components to the assembly hangers as and when needed. This just-in-time process requires precision in supply and demand. David Gaillard is the head of the airlock center. He must be aware of what parts are needed at all times. If just a single curtain is missing, the aircraft cannot be delivered and the entire production line grinds to a halt. Bearing in mind the number of outstanding orders for the A350, a disaster. David tries to avoid delivery bottlenecks and delays by way of stock keeping. Airbus' strategy involves looking to see where the greatest expertise in a particular discipline is located. This is why we work with many factories in Europe and indeed throughout the world too, if you include all of our subcontractors. The logistics are highly complex and that's precisely the challenge our department faces. We coordinate everything and take delivery of parts from all over the world that arrive by plane, train, ship and of course by road too. We're talking about 40,000 deliveries a week. On parle de 40 000 receptions par semaine. And every single delivered item is checked and logged by David's staff. If any part turns out to be damaged, his team immediately organizes its replacement or repair. Components for the A350 arrive on a near daily basis by plane too, seven days a week from early in the morning until midnight. And then there are the machines waiting to be delivered. Airbus has its own tower in order to coordinate all these flights for the factory in Toulouse. The air traffic controllers don't just monitor the air traffic. Alexandre Clavier has an overview of the entire factory site on his monitors. He also coordinates the movement of aircraft between the hangars. Every machine to be maneuvered from one station to the next needs his approval and clearance. Alexandre and his colleagues have to coordinate 50 aircraft movements each day, and that doesn't even account for the rest of the site traffic. Fox, Whiskey, Whiskey, Bravo, Charlie. Okay, cleared for takeoff after the fire truck. Roger, we're pushing back. Cleared for takeoff. Bravo, Charlie. Airbus shares the runway with the public airport at Toulouse Blagnac. Alexandre's team also coordinates the cargo flights with the tower there. A Beluga XL, the prototype for an even larger transport aircraft, has just landed. Airbus 42X Relima, roulé Whisky, Sierra 32, zoom unit pour Pierre Limit. The existing Beluga fleet alone clocks up over 10,000 flight hours each year. We coordinate two types of flights those of the development department and those of production. The ones for the development department are prototypes. The flights for production are aircraft destined for customers, for example, that are being delivered to airlines. Two air traffic controllers are always on duty at the same time. The air traffic control officer responsible for the frequency controls the air traffic in real time. And we also have a coordination officer who is in permanent contact with the tower in Blagnac and the flight test center in order to get takeoff clearance for the pilots. He organizes the takeoffs. The Airbus A350 reaches station 30. The lower the number, the closer the aircraft is to completion. 
Francois, head of cabin installation, checks the fittings of the business class seats. Quality control has done its job and identified minor defects. The inspectors have discovered problems with the movement of the seat backs. An expensive business class seat is expected to function flawlessly. High travel comfort is an important component of modern air transport for Airbus, the airlines, and for the increasingly discerning passenger. Airbus promises A350 passengers higher levels of comfort in all classes. Seats, lighting, cabin pressure, and cabin noise levels have been significantly improved. The noise level, for example, is four times lower than in comparable aircraft, a benefit that mustn't compromise quality in other areas. At this station, we install all the seats from economy to business class. Colleagues from the quality control department check whether the seats have been installed properly. If necessary, defects are rectified by the seat manufacturer. While the remedial work is going on, another team installs the seats in economy class. <laughs> the fuselage of the A350 has an especially large diameter, hence the suffix XWB, which stands for extra wide body. In its standard configuration, the A350-1000 can accommodate 366 passengers, but it's also possible to fit 10 seats per row. This would allow the aircraft to carry as many as 440 passengers. Claire says Caen is the deputy head of Station 30. She supervises and coordinates 30 electricians and mechanics who perform the preliminary function tests and take care of small repairs at the same time. Bonjour. Bonjour. Ça va bien? Ça va et vous? <laughs> Ça va. C'est bon. bon? Tout avance comme ouais, tu veux? Bon, on va monter ce panneau là. Ok, parfait. In contrast with every other assembly line at Airbus, the mechanical and electrical systems of the A350 are worked on in parallel. It is a great responsibility to take care of the safety of the employees and of the aircraft, especially here at Station 30, where different departments work simultaneously. Quality control, production and testing. The key to our successful work lies in the harmonious cooperation required to build the aircraft on time, to the highest quality, and to everyone's safety. There are specialists for every task, however minor. Will this be ready soon? Yes, the specialists will drill the holes shortly and then we can carry on. Perfect. Super. I grew up in Toulouse, so I always saw planes and watched the maiden flights. The residents of Toulouse have always been surrounded by aviation. For me, working here was a dream from an early age. Today, Claire supervises how workers here at Station 30 add the finishing touches to the A350. The workers, for example, close the last gap between the fuselage and the wing at the site of the aircraft. In the cargo hold, electrician Cédric Lormand is testing the cabling. 180 kilometers of cable are installed in every A350. Keeping track of everything here is a complex undertaking. In position now. Okay, I'm ready. Blue. 
אוקיי. The electricians test every single cable in the aircraft. All the systems are still accessible, for now. We're testing the cables. This involves increasing the voltage in order to find out if the resistance is high enough. These are the cables that control the engines. After the test, Cedric's colleague seals off all the connectors again. No dirt can be allowed to get into this sophisticated control system. All of the cables that the pilots use to control the aircraft's functions converge in front of the cargo hold below the cockpit. Safety-related systems are installed in duplicate for redundancy. Specialists inspect every single cable connection here, too irrespective of how difficult they are to get to. They're always conscious of their responsibility. Any mistake that electrician Nicolas Vignier makes now could have fatal consequences. This is where the electronic control systems are located, the heart of the aircraft, as it were. When doing my job, I often think about all the passengers who'll board this aircraft someday and set off on their travels with complete confidence. Once all the function tests have been completed, the aircraft moves on to the penultimate station, Station 20 where its engines will be fitted. The A350 is powered by two state-of-the-art turbofan engines, developed exclusively for this aircraft by Rolls-Royce. It's the most fuel-efficient commercial aircraft engine in the world, the Trent XWB. The engine specialists hydraulically raise the massive turbine up to its mounting points below the wing. They bolt the 8-ton, 50,000-horsepower engine to the aircraft wing using just two mounting brackets. The massive turbine consists of more than 20,000 components, most of them fitted together by hand. Once the turbine is secure on the pylon, the hydraulic transport vehicle is lowered back down. A single turbine costs almost 32 million euros, so great care must be taken when maneuvering. Each of the two engines generates 374.5 kilonewtons of thrust. Each turbine consists of 22 titanium blades and has a diameter of nearly 3 meters. During takeoff, the engine takes in over a metric ton of air each second. Rolls-Royce uses state-of-the-art ceramic coatings inside the combustion chamber because in this turbine, the air-fuel mixture burns at extremely high temperatures, an excess of 2,000 degrees Celsius. The upshot? Around 15% lower fuel consumption and significantly better emission levels than its predecessor. In addition to this, Trent XWB engines are much quieter than any other aero turbine essential for planes flying over heavily populated conurbations.
Before Airbus shipped the first A350 in December 2014, aircraft and engines were subjected to extensive stress tests under extreme climatic and weather conditions that the aircraft would not have to endure during normal operation. Back at Station 20, cabin integrator Laurent Barateau sets about making the last few minor adjustments. Everything must be just right and adhere to the highest standards to ensure acceptance by the customer. Every reading light must be angled properly. No scratches must be allowed to ruin the impression. The list price of an A350-1000 is almost 330 million euros. So the customer understandably expects to receive a first class product. At this point, we examine everything again very closely and place great emphasis on protecting the cabin, as all the elements are very expensive. If you install them, you should avoid damaging them. As several jobs are always being performed inside the aircraft at the same time, everything has to be well protected. Unfortunately, however, we sometimes find some damage or we discover during testing that a seat doesn't work properly. Then we have to rectify the issue. Just a couple of days until completion. Time for the plane to receive its paint job. The painters apply five coats of paint. A polyurethane paint with low volatile organic compound content. That's better for the environment and the painters. The spray guns use an electrostatic spray system. They distribute the paint extremely evenly thus reducing paint consumption and aircraft weight. After four and a half months on the final assembly line, a new Airbus A350 is finished. Finally, the pilots take over and this marvel of modern engineering can take to the skies. 10 aircraft of this type take off on their maiden flight each month. Soon, hundreds of them will be connecting continents and millions of people as they are carried to their destinations worldwide. And as they do, they'll be flying on the most advanced passenger aircraft in the world, the Airbus A350 from Toulouse. A new high-tech excavator is born in record time. The 23-ton monster SY215, built in just 24 hours. The Lingan Mega Excavator Factory. Robots and machines reign supreme here. Their value, 375 million euros. State-of-the-art technology put to work by highly trained specialists, produce astonishing output. A new high-tech excavator rolls off the line here every 10 minutes. This is Mega Manufacturing. One of the largest and most advanced excavator factories in the world. Built from scratch here in the greater Shanghai industry zone at a cost of a half a billion euros. Sunny, the Chinese market leader, manufactures new high-tech excavators here. 
up to 40,000 each year at full production. The goal, to dominate the global market. To help them achieve this, the best seller in the mid-range segment, the model SY215. Its price, 110,000 euros. Reach, 9.57 meters. Digging force, 138 kilonewtons. The Linggang site, almost a million square meters in size. The manufacturing operation, split between three buildings. And it all starts here, at the back of building one. Monday morning, 10 o'clock. A semi-trailer loaded with 75 tons of steel. Value of the delivery, 32,000 euros. Chief Engineer Xu Bin inspects the goods. His team will use the steel to construct high-quality excavators capable of operating for over 20,000 hours under the most extreme conditions. Chief Engineer Xu is satisfied. Production of the new vehicles can begin. This simple steel plating is where it all starts. A perfectly coordinated production chain begins. Washing, cutting to length, forming, shaping, welding, coating, and finally assembly. This basic raw material is transformed into a state-of-the-art machine. It makes me proud. 250 cutting-edge robots and machines will soon turn the steel plating into high-tech excavators. They work with extreme accuracy, down to the micrometer. In order to ensure this level of precision, the rust must first be removed. Just 15 seconds later, everything's smooth and processing can begin. The birth of the new excavator. The steel plating is transferred to a precision plasma cutting machine. In just one operation, nearly a hundred individual parts emerge blinking into the world, all produced from a single plate. Supervisor Liu Minyong must rigidly adhere to the specified cutting pattern. But there's a problem. The steel plate isn't lying perfectly straight. Supervisor Liu must now realign the plate exactly or the machine will cut beyond the edge. The consequence, delays in the production chain and a loss of several thousand euros. The plate of steel was slightly askew. The machine now has to compensate for this. If the steel plate is cut at an angle, the shapes won't be right. We have to reconfigure the machine. There at the front and back so that the plate is no longer a skew for the robot. At last, the plasma cutter starts up. No more corrections can be made now, or all parts will be imperfect and unusable. An arc cuts through the 80 millimeter thick plate of steel using electrically conductive gas. The temperature at the cutting site, 30,000 degrees Celsius. The big advantage of the plasma method, the cutting speed is four times faster than with a conventional cutting torch, which leads to increased overall productivity and accuracy. 20 square meters of raw steel produce 180 individual parts for the excavator. The operation takes just seven minutes. Supervisor Li Yu is on target. The material waste, not even 3%. 
he cuts over 7,000 individual parts in a single shift. They'll be collected for further processing at the allotted time. In order to meet the strict targets set by the company management, the task to produce a new excavator every 10 minutes. The cut parts continue on their journey over a public road to building number two. That's where the state-of-the-art welding plant is located. Robots have taken over almost complete control here. Humans are only responsible for starting the processes. Then they hand over to the pre-programmed experts. Humans begin to clamp the various cut parts of the undercarriage and fixings. This is just the preparatory work. The actual welding operation is performed by the robots. Human precision here is of paramount importance. The machines on the welding line may be fast and accurate, but if the parts are clamped incorrectly, they can't do anything about it. This is the central element of the future excavator, the slew ring. This is where the rotating superstructure and the undercarriage connect. On the inside, a ring gear with 120 teeth and a sprocket with 12 teeth that drives the assembly. The excavators can turn on their own axis. The slew ring is subjected to enormous forces. The connection must remain stable even under a load of four tons. The workers have just 10 minutes to join the components with millimeter precision. The parts are temporarily fixed with 10 centimeter tack welds. Then the robots take over. From now on, human involvement is restricted to control purposes only. The cutting edge welding plant cost 40 million euros. The investment has long since paid for itself. The robot's work is not only more precise than a mere mortal's, they're also twice as fast. The first step, the slew ring is placed on the middle section of the undercarriage. The flame at the welding point, 1,700 degrees Celsius. Thirty-two robots have replaced 24 human workers in this production step. The workmanship is now faultless and utterly precise. Automation has increased the longevity of the excavators enormously, an important criterion for the Chinese to prevail in the competitive international market. transport from one station to the next. Industrial accidents were commonplace here in the past, when the roughly three-ton parts were still being moved by workers using cranes and chains. This danger has now been completely eliminated, saving human lives. The undercarriage consists of three elements, the middle section, on which the slew ring now sits, and two lateral sections. This is where the track system will be mounted later on. The excavator is propelled by two sprocket wheels on each side. The track plates dig up to three centimeters deep into the ground. The giant machines have to maintain their grip even on inclines of 70%. The final section of the welding line. The three elements of the undercarriage are joined. Humans, once again, 
only required for the preparatory work. Across the factory as a whole, increasing automation has led to a one-third reduction in the workforce, while simultaneously increasing output, and with it, the profit too. Every movement the machines make is electronically recorded. If the robot remains motionless for even a second, the company's control department registers the downtime immediately. The control center responsible for the Mega Excavator factory lies almost 100 kilometers to the northwest of Lingang at Sani's Kunshan facility. This is where the real-time performance data is gathered. The controllers also have access to the cameras monitoring the robot line. The images are fed to a 40 square meter display. Pan Rui Gang and his team analyze the data for the purpose of further increasing profit. The consolidated annual profit last year was around 600 million euros. If more orders are received, Deputy Director Pan ramps up the production speed. If individual machines are offline, he adjusts the production schedule accordingly. They have over 30 welding machines in Lingang, and I have all the data for these machines here. Everything is linked via the RED network. For instance, we can monitor a Panasonic welding machine here. It's been powered up for 2.26 hours today and been in operation for 1.78 hours. Its operational readiness is 96.81% and actual operating quota is 78.87%. Its power consumption is 17.30 kilowatt per hour. As you can see, we have all the key data at our fingertips. A masterpiece of internal data management. Back to the factory in Lingyang. The distance by car, a good hour's drive. Exchanging data between the sites takes just a few milliseconds. The welding of the excavator undercarriage is finished. Now it's ready to be painted. Absolute precision is demanded. Despite temperatures of 40 degrees Celsius, the tolerances for the paint job lie in the micrometer range. The Lingang Excavator Factory, built from scratch in just 12 months. When operating at full capacity, Sani could theoretically produce 40,000 excavators here each year. Transport from one station to the next, seamlessly designed. The welded parts are conveyed directly to the paint shop via an automatic aerial cableway increasing speed and productivity. It's like renovating a room at home. First, the surfaces are clean. Then, the workers mask off the areas that must not be painted. The paint shop foreman, Wang Zisheng, he works for eight hours a day in a protective suit, usually in sweltering conditions. But despite this, working here is his dream job. I really like working with paint. I like the smell. Coating the parts with paint is a great job. I can take a product with a rough surface and improve it step by step until it's perfect. Priming. If the workers do a sloppy job, 
the vehicle won't be properly protected against corrosion at the spots that receive too thin a coat, rusting excavators. This would be a disaster for the Chinese company's image. Reliability and performance are paramount. The workers have just eight minutes. Then the section moves down the line to receive its actual finish. The priming has left some minor blemishes. Foreman Wang's people rectify them in just 40 seconds. Now comes the most difficult part. They have just 10 minutes to give the undercarriage a perfect black paint job. Precision work under extreme conditions in 40 degree heat and with a respirator. The most important thing is that the spraying nozzle is always kept perpendicular to the surface and at a distance of 20 to 30 centimeters. If it gets too close, the layer of paint will be too thick. If it's too far away, the coat will be too thin. The painters must work very accurately to ensure the thickness of the coat is just right. If too thin a coat is applied, the slightest scratch will allow the primer to show through. If it's too thick, the material cost across will creep up and reduce the all-important margin. A few years ago, this operation was automated for a short period, but the management decided to remove the robots again. They worked too imprecisely in this case, and as a consequence, were replaced by humans. The massive parts hang from two chains, swinging back and forth slightly. The robots couldn't compensate for this with sufficient accuracy. I use this gauge to check the work. I press it firmly against the surface and check the scale to see how much paint has adhered at which point. The paint layer here is 125 micrometers thick. According to specification, it should be between 80 and 140. That means that this product is acceptable. The parts are now painted. The excavator will soon be brought to life. At one of the most modern production lines in the world. Working non-stop, time pressure. Final assembly for the high-tech monsters. But how do the freshly painted parts get to the assembly building without getting wet? The Chinese solved this problem by building a tunnel. 120 meters long, 10 meters deep. It connects building two with building three. This is where the final assembly line is located. A new excavator is produced here every 10 minutes. At the end of the tunnel, one of the most modern temporary storage facilities in the world. And it's also the start of the final assembly line. The 10 meter high warehouse ensures a constant supply of components. There's space for 20 parts on each side. A detailed schedule indicates which part is needed when. The fully automated crane then carries the elements from their storage location to the production line. What makes the Lingang Mega Factory unique? The final assembly line allows the Chinese to not only manufacture a large number of excavators, but different models too all on the same assembly line, depending on demand. Chief Engineer Xu Bin has a comprehensive overview. This display is updated every few minutes. Everything is recorded, every serial number and the sequence of models. This shows us how many parts are being delivered on this day and how many excavators we actually have to produce. Look here, 
The number varies from day to day. That shows the number on the third day of the week, this year on the fourth. We can monitor every detail of the manufacturing process, and we have the rate of production under control at all times. The four-ton undercarriage must first be turned over. This used to require four assembly workers and took five minutes. And industrial accidents were unfortunately not uncommon. Today, this task is performed by a robot in just 50 seconds. The workers can now install the idlers for the track system. More than 3,000 screws pass through each worker's hands each day in order to manufacture up to 50 new excavators. Final assembly, robots and human specialists working in perfectly coordinated synergy. The mega factory is home to 375 million euros of heavy robotic machinery. The tracks will later run over these rollers. They must be able to maintain their grip on inclines of 70% when on site. An assembly error at this station could put the life of the excavator operator at risk. The time has come for the tracks to be mounted. Wrapped around two large idlers and nine small track rollers. Forty nine interlock track links on each side will later keep the twenty three ton machine on course at a speed of up to six kilometers per hour. On production line two, a team is working in parallel on the superstructure. The production schedule must be strictly adhered to here as well, in order to meet the immense daily production figures. Several dozen black and yellow cab housings await installation. The workers first install the interior fittings of the cabs. One hour of manual work for the seat, control equipment, and electronics. This is the all-important operator interface. Directly behind the driver's seat, a component that sets new standards on the global market, a highly intelligent black box. The high-tech device records all key performance data from the superstructure during operation. Engine parameters, fuel consumption, oil pressure of the hydraulic system. If the values deviate too greatly from the set points, an alarm is triggered. This is transmitted in real time to the control center, thousands of kilometers away. to Kunshan in the northwest of Shanghai. All of the data from the vehicle is collected in Kunshan, from all over the world, around the clock. Pan Rui Gang is proud of this technology. At peak times, up to half a million Sani vehicles are online. His team detects technical problems immediately, usually before the driver operating the excavator does, irrespective of the continent they're on.
We have a complete overview here and can take action ourselves. This is a huge advantage. If the parameters for an excavator are unusual, a red alarm is triggered. For example, if there's a problem with the oil tank, our colleagues then get in touch with the customer by telephone or via the Internet and inform them of the situation. As a result, we can provide better customer service than our competitors. A big advantage in the battle for an increased share of the market. But the Chinese want to impress customers with their innovations as well as their service. In Lingang, the development department is continually testing new features. The excavator of the future. What will it look like? This red test model is also an SY215, but it's equipped with the latest generation of special high-tech equipment. The key new feature, the excavator can be remotely controlled. The driver can control around a thousand different movement sequences by joystick including from a great distance. The big advantage? Excavators like this can be deployed in environments that are very strenuous for people, or even life-threatening. The driver's seat of the special edition model SY215E remains completely empty. Sami provided similar machines to help with the cleanup work in Fukushima. Thanks to remote controlled excavators, no drivers will have to subject themselves to radioactivity or other hazards in future. In extreme situations like this, the Chinese can even control the machines from a very long way away. A cab, an excavator operator, and a virtual reality headset. Not much more is needed to control the 23-tonner. During testing as here, the excavator of the future is located just a few meters away. But in an emergency, the operator can control an excavator elsewhere in the world from his cab in Lingang and, if necessary, on a completely different continent. The only prerequisite? 5G network coverage in the area of deployment. It's then possible to control the vehicle in real time from anywhere on Earth. Back to production line two. The clock is ticking. SY215 must be finished in four hours. The workers install the seat directly in front of the black box. Key components are installed in the superstructure every 10 minutes. The hydraulic pump. It supplies the arms and shovel with an oil pressure of 300 bar. This enables the excavator to lift weights of one and a half tons. The cab, air conditioning system, all round view, fully soundproofed. Operator safety is a key consideration for Sani and for the clients. A Japanese Usushu five liter engine. Power output, 128 kilowatts. Finally, the superstructure is finished. The trickiest and most dangerous stage of the final assembly lies before. The two production lines are united. 
undercarriages and superstructures arrive at 10 minute intervals. Final preparations at production line one. The workers pack the slew ring with grease. This is the junction between the undercarriage and superstructure, where the wheels meet the engine and cab. It's where the excavator rotates through the critical 360 degrees in just five seconds, with as little resistance as possible. The massive superstructure will soon be mounted on the slew ring. A special adhesive provides for initial grip directly after the two sections make contact. But when exposed to the air, it only acts for a short time. Once applied, every second counts for the workers. The time has come. The so-called marriage can begin. A crane system carries the revolving superstructure, which now weighs 12 tons, 20 meters through the air. The difficulty? The superstructure swings back and forth by around 20 centimeters. Shift worker Song Jin Jong is responsible for this critical step. He and his two colleagues must maneuver the swinging cab onto the slew ring. with millimeter precision and do so as quickly as possible because the adhesive is steadily losing its effect. We've been specially trained for this job. We've been given precise instructions on what needs to be done. We have to work quickly but carefully. It can only be done if you have good reactions. Your eyes, brain, and hands must act in concert. Experience is extremely important, too. The critical moment has arrived. The massive superstructure is still swinging alarmingly. And suddenly, everything goes very quickly. Done. The workers secure the connection, held thus far by the adhesive with bolts. The next big moment of the final assembly is fast approaching. Just a few last operations to perform. Oil and fuel are added to the tanks. Then finally, the excavator can move under its own power for the first time. But the entire front section is still missing. A lifting system with massive arms and flexible hydraulic systems, and the excavating bucket. Lunchtime, including for shift worker Zong, who just maneuvered the superstructure onto the undercarriage. The company's management strictly controls work and rest periods by means of a facial recognition system. A facial recognition system records when we arrive for work and when we leave. The modern time clock can't be fooled. It stores his photo along with the exact time. They head to the canteen in an orderly fashion. It's not a requirement, but certainly desired. Everyone here feels more comfortable with a certain orderliness. 1,600 people work here in one of the largest and most modern excavator factories in the world. 
lunch is served in several shifts. The workers can choose between three different meals. The price, one euro. Rice and soup are free. On average, a worker in Lingang earns 1,500 euros a month. The back section of Building 2. This is where the critical phase of the excavator arm installation begins. Around 100 excavator arms are stored here. A thousand tons of steel, enough for just two days. The freshly painted arms mustn't come into contact with rain on the way to final assembly. In this case, they aren't protected by a tunnel, but a bridge. That connects building two with building three at a height of eight meters. The workers now start assembling the complex articulated arm. Especially important, these thin hoses with a diameter of just two centimeters. Hydraulic oil will later flow through them under extreme pressure. The hoses must be able to withstand it, but still be elastic and flexible. Chief Engineer Xu Bin checks to ensure they're installed properly. He knows how important these hoses are. Extreme pressure additives flow through here. In order to withstand the immense pressure, the hoses are reinforced with four to five overlapping layers of wire inside. These are surrounded by two plastic layers on the outside. This allows the hoses to stretch to accommodate movements while simultaneously being able to withstand the extreme oil pressure. Correct installation of the hydraulic system, absolutely critical. When in operation, the bucket can be up to 10 meters from the excavator's center of gravity. But even there, it must still be able to lift and slew one and a half tons. At the heart of the hydraulic system is the pump, with a capacity of 200 liters of oil per minute. It generates a working pressure within the hoses of over 300 bar. It supplies all of the hydraulic components. Boom cylinder, arm cylinder, bucket cylinder. This is necessary for the bucket to achieve its maximum digging force of 138 kilonewtons. The final push on the assembly line. Workers fit the prepared arms to the excavators. After not even 23 working hours, this new SY215 is nearing completion. Sunny has almost doubled its annual profit in the excavator segment that construction machinery giant sells most of its vehicles in China. But they're now increasingly looking to grow their overseas business. The strategy? A little less expensive than their Europeans and American counterparts in order to attract new customers. And a little more expensive than the Koreans, who they want to squeeze out of the market with higher quality and better reliability the finishing touches. The only thing left now is to attach the bucket to the excavator.
It's finished. A new SY215 is on the move. It's worth 110,000 euros. Like all vehicles, the next stop is quality control. Even at its maximum reach of 9.57 meters, the hydraulic system must still operate at full power. The test center is located just a few meters further along, at the end of building three. 20 meters high, roughly 1,000 square meters in size. Extreme stress tests, strict inspectors, the newly assembled excavators now have to demonstrate what they're capable of. The requirement when in use, over a thousand different movement sequences. The most important 200 will now be tested. Test driver Liu Renwei fills the hydraulic system with oil. The stress test begins while it's still running into the excavator. First, test driver Liu runs through the most important basic functions, killing two birds with one stone in the process. The oil gets distributed evenly, and he gets his first impressions at the same time. We've only just filled the new machine with hydraulic oil. The most important thing right now, I want to filter the hydraulic fluid in every system and oil tank in order to ensure the purity of the oil. The next station. Here, the tracking is put to the test. Are the track systems perfectly installed? And can the 23-ton monster drive in a straight line? Li Yu checks the deviation, driving forwards and backwards. Down there is the reference line. We check whether the deviation is within our tolerance range when the excavator is driven over a distance of 20 meters. Our standard is very strict. The permitted deviation, 20 centimeters. Here, it's just eight. Everything's great. The hydraulic systems test. The bucket is raised to a height of almost 10 meters and back down again five times in one minute. The flexible hoses withstand the oil pressure. Now, it's the turn of the slew ring. Five rotations in just 25 seconds, in both directions. Have the technicians perfectly married the superstructure and undercarriage? The excavator passes the test. The functional test of a new model takes 30 minutes. To be able to adequately test the procession of new excavators requires four test operators to be on duty at the same time. Test driver Liu lives his childhood dream every day, driving an excavator under extreme conditions and getting paid to do it as well. It really is a fascinating job I have. I'm involved with excavators in my spare time too. I'm into extreme challenges in the cab. I've even won a prize on a TV show as an excavator operator. All tests passed. One of six new excavators per hour is ready for sale. 
Chief Engineer Shu Bin follows the final test too, and does so with a certain pride. In just 24 work hours, a few pieces of steel plating have been transformed into a new high-tech excavator. I've worked in the excavator industry for many years, and I'm very proud of the developments of recent years. It's impressive to see the output and quality of excavators in China continually improving. Another SY215 has been born into the market. Manufactured in one of the largest excavator factories in the world. The capacity of the cutting edge plant is enormous. By operating a three-shift system, the Chinese could flood the market with up to 40,000 excavators every year. first-rate fire truck built to prevail in the battle against the flames. Pierce from Wisconsin, USA is one of the biggest manufacturers of firefighting apparatus in the world. It's a vehicle made from a combination of aluminum and steel. Tons of life-saving equipment assembled with millimeter precision and a chassis that allows it to rapidly get to the scene of the emergency. The factory is extremely flexible when it comes to incorporating customer wishes, but still manages to produce a top quality product in an impressively short time. Pierce produces its fire trucks in the 70,000 strong town of Appleton in the state of Wisconsin. Over 1,000 vehicles leave this factory each year. The models carry names like Impel, Arrow, Sabre, and Enforcer. The customers design their trucks down to the smallest of details. The lettering is made from real gold leaf. Pierce offers everything from chrome trim to giant turntable ladders. And nearly everything is built by hand. A high performance pump system is of key importance. Pierce also offers extra large trucks, but one model is the undisputed customer favorite the Enforcer. The cab has eight seats. The pump thrusts 5,600 liters into the hoses each minute. An onboard 3,000 liter tank ensures there's sufficient water for firefighting. A 33 meter turntable ladder sits on the roof. And the heavy truck can corner at up to 90 kilometers an hour. Project manager Bill Kyle supervises production of the fire trucks. Each truck is custom designed by the client, so errors can creep in quickly, especially at the first stage, the chassis. Precision is vital here because it has to accommodate all of the enforcer's components. If the assemblers don't stick to the dimensions, the entire production will fail. This is the birth of the truck. We start matching it up to what the customer specifications are, so we make sure we meet that. The customer actually starts picking where they want certain things on their truck, and we need to land that right here on the berth of the truck. 
The initial phase of construction is extremely important because it lays the foundation for all subsequent steps. Todd Lindbergh mounts two 12-meter steel girders for the chassis. As the assembler must make sure that everything is installed absolutely level and equally spaced. To do this, he clamps the steel girders in place using hydraulic presses. They prevent the parts from shifting. The yellow base frame ensures the construction is level. Without such aids, the chassis could lose precision and affect production. These cross members are kind of made to fit. So once they're tight, we should be right at 34 inches. Otherwise, we'll either pull the frame in or move it out and keep it the right, right width so that down the line everything fits. Assembler Todd and his colleagues bolt the chassis together with several cross members. This prevents anything from shifting. The chassis alone weighs nearly four tons. It's the foundation on which the rest of the Enforcer truck will be built. It will be another 44 days until construction is complete. Pierce employs nearly 2,000 assembly workers. One of the key elements is fitted right at the beginning the axle together with matching shock absorbers. This component makes it possible to drive at high speeds, even around corners. The axle system goes by the name Tech 4. Pierce builds this component of the fire truck in its own factory too. It takes a team of three workers to construct the Tech 4 suspensions. The Tech 4 was originally only intended for use on military vehicles. It allows for rapid travel, even over rough terrain. The engineers at Pierce take advantage of its properties for their own requirements. Thanks to its long travel suspension, the Tech 4 axle offers 25 centimeters of vertical deflection. No other chassis allows for such tight cornering. It's able to do a U-turn at a crossroads without having to maneuver. The axle can also accommodate huge brake discs with a diameter of 43 centimeters. They can bring the enforcer to a stop significantly faster than other axles. The customer also has a choice when it comes to the axles and shock absorbers. Different axles can be fitted to the same chassis. Thanks to its handling characteristics, the Tech 4 is a very popular option but also the most expensive. We build our suspension from the ground up. A lot of other manufacturers buy their chassis from another supplier. Pierce starts from the ground up. We start framing it up. We get some of the key components here installed. We'll pick it up and we'll move it over here and we'll install the suspension parts and some of the axles. The team maneuvers the chassis into position. It must be located exactly on the attachment points. The spring eyes afford zero tolerance. Everything must fit perfectly. The subframe is now complete. The rest of the components are already being fabricated by other departments. The Appleton factory is home to the fabrication shop. It's where the chassis, cab, and body are built. The assembly line is located a few miles away. This is where the workers install the electrical systems as well. Pierce also has a paint shop, materials warehouse, and proving grounds here. The enforcer's journey continues in the fabrication shop. Every one of the enforcer's components is made in punch presses like this. Workers place aluminum sheets in the machine. The press punches the pieces out according to a computer-controlled pattern. The 
the workers have to produce hundreds of thousands of parts. Like the parts of a giant clock movement, all of the pieces are perfectly matched to one another. Bill Kurzweil's team must adhere to the engineer's specifications down to the millimeter. There is a very small margin for error. If you think about if the part is bent over 90 degrees and it has to go onto another part, it won't fit. If it's a 16th of an inch narrow, it won't fit over the top of another part. Bill's workers check each finished part using gauges. In addition, scanners in the press rolls check whether everything is within specification. A laser cutter is used for finer cutting patterns because the human eye is too imprecise. The challenge for team leader Bill is not just the multitude of parts, but the tight production schedule. When the other plant is having any kind of technical problem, they contact us if they have a part that's scratched or damaged or whatever was ordered incorrectly. We can stop production, create a brand new part, nest it, punch it, form it, and ship it back over to them in less than four hours. From the truck door to the hose mount, every single part of the fire truck is made here. The formed aluminum parts then move from the fabrication shop to the other side of the factory, where they're used to construct the cab. The workers now assemble the various aluminum and steel sections. Everything must fit together perfectly. Fixtures are used to precisely align the pieces that need welding. The welders use clamps to hold them in place. A warp cab would impair the enforcer's handling characteristics. Amanda Halford oversees assembly of the cab. She isn't just concerned about the angles and gap conditions of the individual components. Did Marvin get the blue issue worked out? We need to make sure that all of the welds um, are smooth, that they're even, that they look consistent, um, that there's no weld defects, um, and then also just meeting all of those options. That's what's gonna be critical to us. The welds mustn't be too thick, or the doors won't close properly. The welds mustn't be too thin either. This would impair stability. It takes the team two to three days to build a cab. During this time, it remains at the same construction bay. This means that it's the responsibility of one worker from start to finish. The cab of the enforcer truck now has a roof. The workers weld grab rails and handles inside the cab so that the firefighters can get in and out quicker in an emergency. Every cab is custom made according to the client's wishes. The workers have welded nearly three tons of steel and aluminum together to form an integral unit. Every cab must be extremely robust to withstand the rigors of the job. Approximately five cabs leave the assembly shop each day. They then move to the other factory site, where the future fire truck is given its distinctive paintwork in the company's own paint shop. A first coat of gray-white primer has already been applied to the bare steel and aluminum. For the perfect paint finish, workers remove every last trace of dust from the surface with compressed air guns. The cab is also wiped down 
so that the paint adheres consistently. The individual nature of each order is especially apparent when it comes to the color scheme. Pierce offers hundreds of shades of red. And there's a huge selection of yellows, too. If a customer still can't find what they're looking for, the company will mix custom colors as well. The time has come. Two specially trained painters prepare the paint for this fired truck in the making. First, they apply another last coat of primer. Only then does the cab of the truck receives its hallmark fire engine red. Pierce entrusts this job to humans rather than robots because they apply the paint more evenly. It takes the painters up to one hour to complete each coat of paint. The components bake in a drying oven over 150 degrees Celsius. And the cab is ready for the next shop, where it will receive some of its fittings and equipment. How it will look in detail is determined by the engineers in the 3D design studio in close consultation with the customer. Every truck is custom designed. 11 employees plan every single vehicle in detail on a computer with the help of a 3D model. All of the other shops must stick to this master. The customers expect a great deal of their special fire trucks. After all, their quality can be a matter of life and death. From the smallest screw to the gigantic turntable ladder, everything must fit perfectly. The cab stays in the assembly building for the time being, but moves on to a different shop, the wiring shop. It doesn't take long before the empty cab is transformed into a fully equipped command center with a warning light system on top. Thousands of feet of cables are installed throughout the cab. Electrician Joe Bauer installs a yellow wiring harness for the airbags. There are hundreds of cables in each cab, so it's vital to keep track of things. It's just getting everything right because everything is custom made. So it's one company wants this and one company wants that. So you got to make sure you have everything in the right order. Rick Roberts is the cab assembly supervisor. He regularly checks up on progress. It's essential that each work step is performed in a set sequence to avoid any mistakes. We set the harnesses inside. There's uh, certain procedures in which we need to, to follow in order to assure that they're dropped out. In a lot of cases, there's uh, tape points or something that tells us where the starting point is. We drag it through the, uh, the cab. We make the dropouts. What we're really doing is we're starting to make sure that all the circuits are the correct circuits being dropped out in each one of these areas. Um, we verify to make sure that there's no damage to the harness after we run through it. We're also making sure that it's secured as it runs through the cab. Um, if there's anything that comes through the roof, we make sure that all, seal, all areas are sealed uh, so we don't have any leakage into the cab. Next, all of the cables are protected with a fuse. Where, where are we at right now with it? So you, right now you just said you, we just got started. Yep. Uh, you're gonna make your connections to your, your bus bars, your yep. fill panels. Put all the battery cables in, the transmission harness. So what are we missing so far? Uh, still have to install the, the dash. Every worker is responsible for different tasks and completes them in strict order. This minimizes mistakes and maintains efficiency. As we go through our stages, we got to make sure that everything's in place before we move on to the next step. Because as you go through this whole process, you'll notice that once we have our harnesses in, we make our final connections, there's going to be wall panels put in, and we have some cabinets that go in, and we have the seats, and we can't do it out of sequence, otherwise we'd have to tear the cab back apart to 
to put the harnesses in or any additional wiring. So it is very important that we do it in sequence, otherwise it causes us a lot of rework. And this must be avoided at all costs, of course. These vending machines are unique to Pierce. They're located all over in the factory. The workers fetch work materials, such as drill bits, sealants, and even simple brushes as and when needed. The advantage, Pierce only pays for the work materials that are actually used. As long as it's still in the vending machine, it doesn't belong to the company. Once the fire truck has been equipped with a fuse boxes, the radio communication systems are installed. Hundreds of kilometers of wires are installed in each truck within just four days. The interior fittings includes the seats. The customer can choose everything from the type of seat cover material to the logo. There are eight seats installed in each enforcer truck in a space-saving configuration, so the firefighters have plenty of room to move around. The cab is then ready for technical acceptance. At this point, all we're really trying to do is make sure that all the circuits are working properly, all the switches are functioning properly, all our lighting is functioning properly, just to assure that when it goes to the next stage, the cab gets mounted onto the chassis, that we don't have any issues. It's a tense moment for team leader Rick. Have all the cables been laid properly? And is everything working flawlessly? Electrician Mark Moser performs the check. If the enforcer cab doesn't pass this test, a time-consuming search for the fault will begin. Mark uses a software program to assist him with the technical acceptance. He runs through all of the functions one by one. There are no problems this time. Test passed. It's great satisfaction in that. That's our ultimate goal here is to make sure that we produce a quality product to our downstream customers. So. A milestone has been reached. This truck is fitted out and ready to get powered up. But several important steps still lie ahead before the fire truck is ready for service. Work continues in the adjacent area where workers mount the finished elements onto the enforcer's chassis in the assembly area. The huge engine block will now be installed at this precise location on the chassis. It not only drives the truck, but supplies the pump system and turntable ladder with power as well. Assembly worker John Cruel must be careful that the 500 horsepower engine doesn't crush any cables during installation. The technician can only install everything safely with the help of a colleague. It's one of your main hookups for everything, so your, your chassis and everything is communicating with your chassis and gauges are communicating with the engine and everything. It's one of the main, main hookups. Assembly worker John must bolt everything together tightly. The engine will be in service for several decades for a good cause, and this thought motivates the workforce. I've been here uh, 12 and a half years now. I've been doing uh, building fire trucks and stuff. It's nice that it's going back to uh, men and women who need it and stuff, you know. It's a good feeling. It's, a, it's, it's like a big community or whatever with all the firefighters and stuff. Another hurdle has been overcome. Pierce manufactures trucks in its Appleton factories seven days a week. Brakes are a must. Every shift has several. The workers bring along their own food and prefer to spend their break time on their smartphones. Everyone enjoys the peace and quiet in the otherwise so noisy factory. 
Although Pierce does offer snacks in the break rooms, most of the workers prefer to stay at their workplaces. In the assembly building, workers are now installing the enforcer's windshield. This is followed by the marriage of the cab and chassis. This will show whether the work thus far has been done properly. Have all shops adhered strictly to the engineering drawings? The mechanics must be careful not to crush any of the cables that are hanging down. Done. The precision workmanship at the previous stages has paid off. In parallel to this, one of the most important components of the fire truck is being built at a sister factory eight kilometers away in the north of the town. It's pump. Pierce buys the pumps from specialist vendors. Here, they're prepared for installation. The pump is the core component of the enforcer. It sits securely anchored directly behind the cab in approximately the center of the vehicle. Connections lead from the pump to the enormous water tank. When in operation, the pump thrusts up to 5,600 liters of water into the hoses each minute. In order to do this, it needs to be supported in a sturdy frame, the so-called pump house. This ensures that the truck doesn't begin shaking under the enormous forces and pump performance remains stable. In cities, the pump is connected to a fire hydrant. It distributes the water amongst the hoses and controls the pressure. An onboard tank serves as a reserve. Some jobs, however, don't just require water, but foam too. This is generated by the foam system by mixing water with air and a concentrate. The firefighters can adjust the exact composition of the foam via a control panel. Assembler James Philbrick now fits connector pipes to the pump for the fire truck's water tank. It takes a lot of experience to get the positioning right. You can't fight a fire if you can't turn on the water. The control levers are installed by the specialist colleagues next door. Yeah, so just tack everything. You got weld bits and pipe, and we just tack everything together. And we take it off, which I'm going to do right now. And I take it over to Mark. He's our TIG welder, and he'll TIG it all up. And then... we we'll come back like that and put it back in. It should be all sealed up. It's a complicated and time-consuming jigsaw puzzle, with each station contributing their own piece. Once the welding work has been completed, the workers spend hours connecting the hoses and valves. The pump spends around a week at the pump-up before being released for installation. Extra care must be taken during this production step, because if the pump doesn't work properly, this costly fire truck isn't for purpose and is absolutely useless for fighting fires. The finished pump house is transported to the other side of Appleton for installation at the assembly plant. Its home is behind the cab. Brian Vinthurst is responsible for ensuring it's installed correctly. He must mount it perfectly square and level. Making sure that it's jigged correctly, making sure that it's balanced so that when we do hang it over the chassis, we come down nice and nice and level. So, uh, especially for, um, for quality, we don't want to damage anything. Every pump is custom made too. A real challenge for Brian. So there's lots of different weight variations in the pump, which I use the come alongs and weight, uh, sandbags to make sure that I can level that out because there's different weight distributions because all the pumps are custom. Assembler Brian has to position the pump exactly.
Only then can he lower it onto the chassis. If mounted incorrectly, the pump could unbalance the entire truck, affecting its firefighting capabilities. The pump is not yet positioned correctly. It's protruding too far over one side of the black chassis. Assembler Brian makes the necessary adjustments, millimeter by millimeter. He finally sets the pump down. Is everything in the right place? What I'll do is I'll drop the cab. The cab will come pretty close to the pump house here. Um, the, the, the pump house does sit in some isolators and I want to take some measurements to make sure that we're, we're, uh, we're the same distance on each side, making, making it square here so that when it goes down the line, uh, we don't run into issues with it being unsquare. It will soon become apparent whether the enforcer's pump house is in the right place. There has to be a two inch gap between it and the cab. And there is. Brian has installed the pump exactly according to plan. Very happy. Uh, the pump went on the way it was supposed to. It's square off of the, off of the cab. Therefore, when it goes down to the line, uh, the, the body will go on uh, nice and square. The chassis has already been mated with the cab, the engine, and the pump house. Our fire truck is now taking shape. But the enforcer's entire turntable ladder assembly is still missing. This is where the so-called torque box comes in. This is a tubular structure made from thick sheet steel. It forms the connection between the chassis and the turntable ladder. The torque box stabilizes the truck when the aerial is in use and provides storage for ground ladders. On the back, there's a large pedestal where the ladder will later sit. A team of three workers mounts the torque box on the chassis of the fire truck. It's so large that one person can't keep an eye on everything at once. Two cranes lift the seven-ton monster into position. While the black box is still hovering above the chassis, the workers run the hydraulic hoses into place. They connect the engine with the pedestal of the turntable ladder, allowing it to move independently of the truck and access even the most difficult fire scenes. Again and again, the technicians have to intervene to ensure there is no interference with the chassis. But in the end, they get it in the right position. Another important step has been accomplished. The fire truck is still missing its rear structure, the so-called body. This is manufactured in the sister factory, in the fabrication shop. This shop manufactures the body from pre-cut sheet aluminum, similar to the cab. The workers join the sheets with clamps to form the large side panels. This is followed by a lot of welding work. A day's work later, and both side panels of the enforcer truck are finished. The workers have to strictly adhere to the panel dimensions so that everything fits together in the end. They use the detailed master construction plan as a reference. The body needs a lot of storage space for the firefighter's tools and hoses. The water tank will be installed in the middle, protected by the side panels. Production manager Bill is present for the installation of the body. It will now be determined whether all of the teams have followed the specifications of the 3D design studio. We're getting ready to pick up this body and mount it onto the chassis. All of our mounting angles uh, are all leveled and ready to go. So we're at that point in the op phase that we're ready to pick this up and mount the body onto the chassis. For Bill, it's like a big puzzle made up of many individual parts that gradually come together to form a complete picture. 
the enforcer enters the decisive final assembly stage. We're making sure that our platform in the back here is level with the platform in the front so we have the body level on each side and front to back. So we'll make sure that the body figures in with the pump and with the cab once it gets up to be that far. Another critical moment. Have their colleagues in the fabrication shop completed their work accurately? Will the six meter long component sit properly? Okay, go ahead. Production manager Bill directs his colleagues with centimeter precision. A small gap between the cab, pump, and body is desired. It makes the enforcer more flexible on uneven roads, but the design as a whole doesn't include much tolerance. Finally, the body fits and is waiting for the next component to be installed. This task is performed by foreman Brock Rosendale. His job is to mount the enforcer's 3,000 liter water tank in the body. If the tank swings uncontrolled into one of the body side panels, it could be damaged. Brock takes it slowly. If all the dimensions are right, it isn't a complicated task for him, but care must be taken here too. Cradle's tolerance is only about a half an inch bigger than the tank. So this one with the walls being so close and there's weldments inside the walls, it's pretty, pretty precise. That's why we go nice and slow with the crane, so. The body, including the water tank, has been successfully installed. The fire truck is ready for the final and all important assembly steps. These include the application of the lettering, an emblem of the future owners. In North America, Pierce's main sales territory, a great deal of importance is attached to the visual elements. A lot of time and attention to detail goes into this step. The design shop creates all logos by hand. The lettering is not just applied using normal paint, but is embellished with real gold leaf. Only if the customer orders it, of course. The enforcer is still missing a crucial component. The turntable ladder is built in the so-called aerial shop. The 33 meter long ladder is mounted on the pedestal of the torque box. Depending on the customer order, a large work platform or remotely controlled nozzle is mounted at the tip. New ladders are delivered to the aerial shop several times a week. A supplier located around 100 kilometers away in Kiwani, Wisconsin, manufactures the turntable ladders. All that arrives are the individual ladder segments, however. The workers have to run all the cabling and install them ready for deployment. In terms of surface area, the aerial shop is the largest shop in the entire factory. Jeremy Pahoki is responsible for final assembly of the delivered ladder elements. His team runs the cables and control technology for each ladder. Jeremy and his colleagues need a whole day for the work. The turntable ladder is a complicated and important component of the enforcer. The ladder elements mustn't pinch any cables. Jeremy must also ensure that the ladder can run freely and has sufficient play. Pierce guarantees its customers that the 33 meter ladder can be extended in under a minute. Well, it's very important that we test this ladder. We run it in and out. We check all the clearances. We have people watching all over the ladder. Everything must clear. And uh, we'll do this a couple of times and make sure everything is correct. If not, we will make the corrections and uh, keep going. Testing the ladder on the ground before it's mounted on the fire truck is important in order to detect any faults as early as possible because making corrections is very difficult once the turntable ladder is mounted on the truck. 
Pierce offers a 20-year guarantee on its turntable ladders. So everything's going very well with this one. These are uh, a very straightforward design, um, very easy to put together for me. There's not too many problems I, I run into with it. Pierce supplies six different ladder lengths, and again, customization is key. The customer can also choose the color, the control technology, and what type of tip they want on their ladder. The Pierce ladder can reach up to the 10th floor of a building. It's made from high strength steel. This means it can support the high loads at the tip of the aerial. The sturdy construction of a ladder makes it heavy at the same time. The torque box structure transfers all area loads onto the outriggers. The outriggers keep the truck in its proper position while operating the aerial device. The Enforcer fire truck is now ready for the final step, installation of the ladder. This task is performed by Steve Ochen. Well, right now the most important part about all of this is to make sure that we don't twist the ladder when we pick it up under its own weight and that uh, we keep our area safe, make sure nobody's going to be walking under it in case the cranes were to fail at any way. Steve and his colleague Cody Dean hang the 33 meter long ladder from two cranes. The installation begins. Despite the size of this component, it requires millimeter precision to install successfully. Steve has to feed a thin anchor cable into the swivel anchor at a particular angle. He has no devices to help him only the experience and watchful eyes of his colleague, Cody. Going down. First, the assembler lowers the turntable ladder until it's roughly in position. Then, he starts making fine adjustments. Right now, I have to angle the ladder so that I can drop the swivel anchor into the anchor point on the swivel. So I'm just trying to get the right angle between the front and the back so that I can start lowering it down. It would be bad if we were to break something. These parts are very expensive. <laughs> the electrician starts lowering the platform very slowly because it's a matter of millimeters. Colleague Cody tries to find the correct position. The upper ladder platform has to fit onto the anchor pins of the swivel module. All right, I'll pick up the front. Will the installation fail at this last critical point? It's a matter of millimeters. Things go better the second time around, but the connector cable is causing problems. Can't see it? No, it runs with these spacers. I can never see the. Come on down a little bit. Keep coming. Oh, it already hit. I'm gonna try to go back south. And then, the breakthrough. The ladder cable is inserted into the right connection of the swivel module of the torque box. 20 minutes later, the ladder sits majestically atop the enforcer. I mean, we had a little bit of an issue trying to eye up the swivel anchor to the swivel, but everything went really well. The team still has to make the cable connections and securely bolt the ladder in place. But then the Enforcer truck is finished. Custom made according to customers' wishes. It is a very nice challenge. Um, it is great to be a part of doing something a little different every day. We designing it to the customers, having the right framework for this certain truck and making sure that we meet what the customer is looking for. 
Before the enforcer is delivered to the customer, it's first put through its paces. The company has its own proving grounds for this purpose. In this building, engineering manager Dan Reiter tests the enforcer's pump. He runs it for two hours at full power. An unbelievable 5,600 liters of water flows through the connection pipes each minute. This is the volume each pump must deliver when fighting a fire. And keep doing so for many years to come. If it's not running right, we'll start looking into it. If we got something not hooked up right, um, is there a fault with the pump, something not plumbed correctly? Uh, so we start doing some investigating to see why it's, why it's not pumping correctly. The water that's pumped through the system doesn't go to waste, but is recirculated. Sensors detect any irregularities in the pumping operation, but everything runs smoothly with the enforcer today. A momentous occasion. The fire truck is about to leave the factory grounds for the very first time. One of the most important features of this fire truck is the special axle suspension system. It's designed to enable the emergency services to reach their destination quicker because it allows for cornering at higher speeds. Today's driver is David Hutchins. He drives the enforcer around Appleton for a test drive. Then he heads for the closed off testing area. Here, an obstacle course of bumps and potholes await the Tech 4. Does it deliver the promised suspension travel of 25 centimeters? The expensive axle system fully meets expectations. The second important test is passed. For the final task, tester David connects the enforcer to a water supply. The pump starts up. The outriggers of the torque box extend. It's now time for the turntable ladder and the remotely controlled nozzle at its tip. David controls the ladder as it would be during a real emergency from the control panel on the turntable. It should take less than 60 seconds to completely extend the ladder are all the cables properly secured. Everything must function perfectly, so it performs when it matters. The ladder extends smoothly during this test. David and his colleague maneuver the ladder into position for the final test. The pump is running, the water flowing. David sprays water out of the remote controlled nozzle across varying settings. We don't have any leaks. Ladder, it, it's working good. The long turntable ladder works perfectly in all configurations and exhibits no defects. The colleagues from the aerial shop have done their job well. A new fire truck has passed its third and final test and will shortly be delivered to the customer. The enforcer is finished according to plan and performs well in every test. It took roughly three months to build and the new truck from Appleton will be delivered to another group of brave firefighters and can expect to be saving lives in service for the next 25 years. Tires, one of the key components of a car affecting safety and efficiency. But how do you create the perfect tire for the road and for the racetrack? It's work that has a lot of responsibility. I can't switch off mentally. I have to always be on the ball. 
It takes 100 constituents, 15 manufacturing steps, and over 50 performance tests undertaken in high-tech laboratories. Only then will the P0, Pirelli's flagship product, take to the streets of the world. When it comes to the manufacturing process, we're talking about a machine that has to perform flawlessly. And this is only made possible thanks to mega manufacturing, perfect in every detail. Turin, Italy, production plant of the most famous tire manufacturer in the world. Each day, 1,200 workers at the factory manufacture thousands of the high-performance P0 tires for the road and for Formula One, too. A tire that can withstand the toughest of challenges and is trusted by the world's leading car manufacturers and race car drivers. A tire that's so much more than simply rubber. A high-tech product with complex internals involving around 100 starting materials, processed into about eight component parts. And everything is tuned to the requirements of individual car models. True mega manufacturing. And it all begins here at the Turin factory. The P0 is born in building A. Eight o'clock in the morning, the first trucks deliver the raw materials for a world-class tire. The most important ingredient, natural rubber. The basic raw material for around 130 years. Around 70% of the global rubber harvest is used to manufacture tires. Plant manager Alessio Secchi regularly verifies the acceptance of the shipment. Ciao Antonio. Ciao Antonio, good morning. Good morning. Everything okay? Yes, the rubber shipment from Indonesia has just arrived. Natural rubber is made from liquid latex harvested from rubber trees. They're grown predominantly in the so-called rubber belt surrounding the equator, which includes Indonesia. The quality and variety are decisive for the future rubber compound. Dozens of trucks arrive here every day. They come loaded with dozens of tons of very different materials. We have to then process them correctly. This is done according to the first in, first out principle. This means that whatever arrives first is processed first and everything is traceable, so we can not only tell where the raw materials come from, but what the quality is too. The natural rubber is still highly temperature sensitive, rock hard when cold and soft and sticky when warm. Not exactly desirable properties for a tire. A key step at the end of production turns this sticky mass into the elastic rubber so vital for tires. But not all rubber is the same. Different types of rubber are used depending on the type of tire, summer or winter, Formula One car or sedan, and rubbers made in the laboratory too. The advantage of the white synthetic rubber is that its properties can be designed in the lab, specific to the rubber compound's eventual use. The rubber compound plays a key role in tire manufacture. There are at least 10 different compounds in a tire. And we need at least 20 ingredients to make each compound. And all with the single goal of creating the perfect tire. Whether for the road or the racetrack. And achieving the best possible compromise between three irreconcilable and contradictory properties. Low rolling resistance, strong grip, and low wear. 
The secrets of this mega manufacturing operation lie on the other ingredients too. A precisely measured blend of fillers, antioxidants, plasticizers, and curing agents. These include, for example, oils, resins, and carbon black. Only with their help is it possible to reconcile the various contradictory properties in a single tire. Maximum grip in all weather conditions combined with minimal rolling resistance and wear. All raw materials have to be analyzed in the factory laboratory. Any inferior ingredients would jeopardize the quality of the final product. 30 employees work in three shifts here. Their job, nothing short of ensuring the quality of umpteen thousand tires every day. Laboratory technician Giuseppe Brancati is checking the quality of today's carbon black delivery. I'm checking the iodine content of the carbon black. We do this for each delivery. We check all of the raw materials in order to guarantee the future quality of our P0s. Carbon black extends the lifespan of the tires. The laboratory technicians use an iodine solution to assess its surface structure and thereby its efficacy. We use a variety of tests to check the quality of the raw materials. We analyze the materials using infrared or by checking their melting point. The compound for the tire will only be right if the raw materials remain consistent. There are other departments in the laboratory where we analyze the final rubber compound, for instance. We analyze everything from the start to the end of production. 20,000 laboratory tests are performed each month to ensure maximum performance on the road. The tested starting materials continue their journey in building A. The next step, to perfectly blend all of the ingredients. An enormous machine with internal rollers blends the ingredients into a homogeneous mass for a few minutes at more than 150 degrees Celsius. But the perfect manufacturing process is only one half of the company's recipe for success. The other, the workforce. Walter Saita has been working at the plant for 25 years. I've worked in many departments over the years, but I moved here at my own request. It's not my thing to be in just one place all the time. I'm like a jack of all trades and can be assigned anywhere. And I've trained a lot of new colleagues over the years as a result. Walter's task, to create the perfect rubber for the perfect tire. The basic conflict, if the compound is too soft, the tire will grip well, but wear too quickly. Harder compounds will last longer, but provide less traction control. This is why it takes more than a single compound. Up to 10 different rubber compounds are required for different zones of the tire. A car tire is a complex high-tech product with many individual layers. The airtight inner liner, what used to be the inner tube. Bonded with woven textile fibers in the carcass, the main body of the tire. Steel wires embedded in rubber form the steel belt. And the outermost layer, the tread, that makes contact with the road surface. It's what determines how well the tire grips the road. Tires have to withstand extreme stresses, and they mustn't lose traction under any circumstances. Ultimately, it's all about passenger safety. The various rubber compounds continue their journey in building B. This is where the individual components of the P0 are fabricated. It's also when the future tread pattern is prepared. The rubber sheets are made into the tread.
A complex process that requires little human involvement nowadays. It, on the other hand, has a key role to play, the extruder. A largely computer-controlled machine that transforms the rubber compounds into treads. The rubber is heated to around 100 degrees Celsius to make it malleable. An internal screw then forces it through the die. The workers monitor the various processes within the 50-meter-long machine. Stefano Testi supervises the production operation. He's tasked with ensuring continuous improvement in the production process. In this section, we produce the tread that will affect the future tire's traction, grip, and rolling resistance, and thus the overall handling characteristics of the car. Only when all of the processes are working in perfect harmony will the extruder output the ideal tread, creating that magic combination of maximum grip and minimal rolling resistance. The extruder has blended various rubber compounds to form a single tread. In order to trace which compounds are in which treads, every single one is assigned a number. Creating the perfect tire, whether for the road or for Formula One, requires perfect mega manufacturing. The first stage of the manufacturing process is complete. A hundred meters of tread will soon form a part of the new p zeros the ultimate car tire. Whose properties are being constantly refined 140 kilometers away in Milan? The headquarters of the research and development department. 1,900 engineers in different countries work on optimization processes. The upshot? Over 200 million euros spent on research each year. Andrea Vergani is one of the managers of the development department. He supervises prototype production. The tread is an aspect that developers in Milan focus on too. A tread design optimized on the computer is about to be applied to a prototype. I've entered all the data. We need the same method as before. We start by scanning the surface. Before, we never knew exactly where the laser would hit. The machine helps the team to develop or improve tire treads. It's a special laser drawing machine. We can use the laser to trace the outlines on a smooth tire. This is how we make the prototypes for a new tread line that will later be produced by the thousands. Although the machine is fully automated, Andrea and his colleague still have to monitor the process. The laser burns black lines into the white painted tire. The lines are made where the grooves of the tread will be later. There's a fundamental conflict when it comes to the tread pattern too. To achieve good cornering and braking characteristics on dry roads, the contact patch needs to be as large as possible. But for optimal water displacement, in order to prevent aquaplaning, the opposite is true. For this reason, the P0's tread design consists of three elements with wide longitudinal grooves that can rapidly displace water. An S-shaped design that increases safety during critical braking maneuvers. And three solid central ribs. They improve braking and traction at high speeds. The next step isn't reliant on technology, but craftsmanship. The schiobiatori, or cutters, finish the tread on the prototypes using special tools and a variety of widths. What are you working on at the moment? I'm making a beautiful cut. 
This is your season. This is the cut for an all-season tire that ensures safe driving in wet and dry conditions the year round. Asciutto, bagnato e sulle quattro stagioni. Paolo Tona is proud to be involved in creating new car tires. When I'm out and about, I'm always checking out other tires. I look at what the competition is doing or see what we've developed in the past. This is where projects like a new P0 begin. We make the prototypes here. The tire then goes to the development department. The product is brought to market, and I get to see the tires on cars. I think that's really cool. Cutting the tread of a tire can take up to 20 work hours. The advantage of the handmade prototypes? The developers can change the tread design more quickly, following initial testing results, if it turns out to be too loud, for instance. The tread pattern also influences noise. As a rule, the more aggressive the tread pattern, the more noise. The research team attempts to optimize this aspect as well, because significant component of traffic noise is caused by the tires. Maurizio Mauro tests in an anechoic chamber. Sound isn't reflected by the walls in here. It allows conditions that closely simulate the real environment to be artificially created in the lab. And all with the single goal of making the perfect tire as quiet as possible. We used to bring cars in here and do the test with the vehicles in situ. We measured the noise levels inside and outside the vehicle. Nowadays, we can achieve the same results with this Toretta machine, that means little tower. The use of cutting-edge technology here helps reduce research costs too. This test involves a speed drop from 150 to 20 kilometers per hour. The speed of the tire is displayed on this monitor here. We can see the microphones here. One on one side of the tread track and one on the back side. This allows us to check noise emission at both speeds. Even for cars with combustion engines, the biggest part of the noise results from the tires alone. For electric vehicles, it's even greater. To make the tires roll as quietly as possible, the developers usually arrange the tread blocks at a slight angle to the rolling direction. This is true for the P0 as well, whose manufacture continues with maximum efficiency in Turin. Mega manufacturing of a high-tech car tire in a factory that consumes as much energy as around a thousand homes. In building B, over one kilometer of metal cords go into each tire. Its job, to lend the tire stability, even under extreme conditions. The steel belt sits directly beneath the tread and cap plies. Two layers are laid on top of one another so that the metal fibers are at an angle of approximately 30 degrees, which forms the so-called radial tire. A milestone in tire development. The steel wire is plated with brass in order to protect against rust and help it bond with the rubber. Tires are a complex product. They're reinforced internally with fabric and metal cords. Before the metal cords can be processed, they first have to be embedded in rubber. This is what the so-called calendar does. The calendar va appunto questo. 
Car tires have to take a lot of punishment. How does the manufacturing team minimize wear, even when performing extreme driving maneuvers? How is rolling resistance reduced? The steel belt makes this all possible. In order for the steel cord to bond properly with the rest of the tire, it has to be coated with rubber. This is done by the calendar, a machine consisting of several heated steel rollers. They ensure that components fuse together properly. Once the metal cord has been encased in rubber, it's cut by the machine. This sheet will later form the steel belt we'll need to manufacture our p zeros. Another important component of the P0 rolls off the production line and now has to be cut to length. And getting the cut right is crucial. It should be angled so that the fibers in the finished tire run perpendicular to the direction of travel. This is necessary for the steel belt to withstand high speeds. A similar process is used to create the fabric rubber composites used on the insides of the tire the carcass. This also gives the tire its stability. And all this is the result of an unceasing research program, 140 kilometers away in the Milan Research Department. The prototype tire is pushed to its limits. Today, a P0 for Formula One is on the high-speed test rig. The tire must withstand speeds of up to 400 kilometers per hour and temperatures of over 100 degrees Celsius. The technicians painstakingly analyze every variation in performance. The research team has just one mission, to constantly refine the P0. The valuable lessons that Pirelli learns from the P0 used in motorsports eventually benefit all customers. Piero Massani, Senior Vice President for Research and Development, has worked for Pirelli for 30 years. He and his team are responsible for every innovation regarding the P0. It isn't sufficient to just meet the general requirements of the car manufacturers. We always adapt the tire for the individual car models. As such, the customer can always get what they need. There isn't actually just one P0. Marked on the side wall is the tire size, abbreviation for the construction type, and recommended speed category. Some car manufacturers get a tire tailor-made for their models, be it for the racetrack or the road. The developers tune the tires to complement the car in parallel to its development. The so-called flat track test assists in this process. Piero Misani makes a flying visit he supervises all of the tests performed by his staff. His team is laying the foundations for the innovations of tomorrow. What kind is this? It's a GT Motorsport tire, 325, 70, 18. Let's see what the X-ray examination says. For most of its 150-year history, Pirelli tested and optimized all of its tires on the test track. Today, indoor testing results in time savings and delivers more accurate results, obtained on a test rig that's just 10 by 10 meters in size. Here we can simultaneously see all the parameters for the tire mounted on the machine, such as speed, vertical forces, torque, temperature and pressure. This is a sophisticated piece of equipment. We can use it to view all of the physical measurements on the monitor during the test. This is all part of the manufacturing process for the P0. The computer uses all of the analyzed data to create a virtual tire almost in real time. 
Based on the information from the sensors fitted to the machine, we construct a model of the tire that's transferred to a driving simulator along with a model of the car. We can then monitor everything on the driving simulator as if the tire were on a test track. This greatly reduces development time. But the upshot? We can design the ideal tire for a car that's still in development. This is a much more efficient approach. The team uses this technique to develop tires for general sale, as well as custom products, specially tailored to the needs of car manufacturers for their latest models. For every type of vehicle, from a Formula One car to a sedan. And that's by no means the end of the story. Piero Misani and his development team are already working on the tire of the future. We've designed some cyber concepts. For example, we have an intelligent tire that can communicate. A tire can pass on so much information. After all, it's the only part of a vehicle actually in contact with the road. A tire can reveal a great deal of information about itself and data about where it's going. And this information is vital for safety. Advancements that were unthinkable when the company was founded. In 1872, Giovanni Battista Pirelli established a rubber factory for manufacturing telegraph cables and bicycle tires. Pirelli began manufacturing car tires in 1901 and made its first foray into motorsports at the Paris Peking race just six years later. The company is now the exclusive tire supplier to various motor racing series, including the most exacting test in the world of motoring, Formula One. Here, its rubber compounds often make the difference between winning and losing. We love challenges and innovations. They keep us at the forefront of the world of motorsports. We're constantly developing new technologies for motor racing that quickly end up with our customers. We're the official tire suppliers to top championships such as Formula One and Superbike for motorbikes. The P0 family represents the link between motorsports on the racetrack and the motorist in everyday life. Today, the company is the leading tire manufacturer in the prestige segment and is gearing up for the future. High-tech plants are already producing the Formula One tire of tomorrow today and in the not-too-distant future for the road, too. Robots represent the future of tire production, working more accurately and with increased energy and CO2 efficiency, key concerns for the motor industry in general. Mega manufacturing at the highest level. Meanwhile, in Building A, the process of fusing the individual components together so-called building is underway. Only if all of the components complement one another perfectly will a tire be produced that can meet all of the demands. An airtight layer of rubber is wrapped around the drum. This inner liner does the job of the former inner tube. Next up is the carcass. The supporting structure of the tire, it consists of rubberized textile fibers. The beads ensure the tire sits securely on the wheel rim. The side walls are made from flexible rubber to improve ride comfort. Another machine applies two steel belts. They ensure stability and protection. And on the outside, the tread. The tread pattern and composition determine the level of grip, wear, and rolling resistance. In the final step, the inner and outer parts of the tire are fused together. All this happens very quickly. First, the inner liner is placed on the drum. Then, the carcass. Followed by the beads. Together with the sidewalls, these parts form the basic structure of the tire.
Meanwhile, another part of the machine joins two steel belts together and wraps them with nylon. The belts increase stability. The treads are placed on top. Now, they're ready to be united. The belts and carcass celebrate their marriage. The so-called green tire is finished. It looks almost like a tire, but still has no tread pattern and is neither elastic nor especially durable. Giuseppe Rallo sticks a final barcode onto the P0. Even after many years at the company, he's still proud to work at this station. My team leader and my colleagues have all done a great job showing me the ropes. Believe it or not, there's always something new to learn here about how you can do something even better. It's work that has a lot of responsibility. I can't switch off mentally, I always have to be on the ball. A few steps later, the vulcanization takes place. Now the rubber and green tire will be turned into a finished P0. The machine fuses all of the components together at a temperature of more than 150 degrees and a pressure of more than 15 bar. There's a pressure bladder inside that inflates and presses the all green tire on the mold. The tread is pressed inside the mold which is engraved with the tread pattern. During the vulcanization process, the soft material is transformed into elastic rubber. The smooth rubber blank has become a tire with a unique tread pattern. The tire only gets its final shape during the last step. The P0 has almost reached the finish line. All that's left are the final inspections. These are undertaken at finishing in building B. As at all the other stations, the workers here have to maintain strict quality standards. The procedure is always similar. It starts with a visual and tactile inspection. Special attention is paid to the internal areas, which must later make perfect contact with the rim. The worker scrapes off even the smallest pieces of surplus rubber and examines the inside of the tire. All of the components that make up the carcass must be perfectly positioned. Ecco qua. The first step during finishing is the visual inspection. We train our workers continually. They can tell at a glance if there are small irregularities on the surface. They're often merely aesthetic issues. But our P0 should not only perform great on the road, but look perfect too. Only when the inspector gives the green light can the high-tech tire proceed to the next station. The diameter and width of the P0 are defined with millimeter precision. An X-ray machine checks the internal metal construction. Only afterwards may the tire fulfill its destiny, making contact with the roads of the world. The tread is the star of the show at this station too. The x-ray unit reveals any flaw. This unit is called sheerography. We use it to inspect the tread and sidewalls. We check whether there are air pockets on the surface or if the steel belts have become detached. This is the first automatic inspection. Then it goes to the x-ray unit. 
There, we inspect the tire and the belt once again. The sidewalls, the bead assembly, the entire surface of the tire, actually. Giuseppina Chiari started working here immediately after leaving school. I actually come from the first station, so used to work at semi-finishing. Now, I've moved to the end of the manufacturing process, to inspections. I enjoy the work, and Formula One, too. I watch Formula Three and X races, too, especially when Pirelli equips the cars with our tires. The P0 on its way to the final inspection. This machine conducts a multi-stage test of the tires. For example, checking whether an imbalance has developed during production. This can not only negatively impact its handling characteristics, but result in uneven tread wear too. Each new P0 series has to pay a visit to the test track as well. In Vizola, four kilometers away from Milan Malpensa Airport, lies the wet test track, the Campo Prove. The site covers 250,000 square meters and was opened in 1971. Today, a new P0 series is being taken for a spin. The tire is fitted to a Porsche 911, the manufacturer's most iconic sports car. Porsche was the first manufacturer to order custom-made tires from Pirelli. The car maker had specific ideas about what the driving characteristics should be. Superb handling, precise steering, and safety reserves in the event of aquaplaning. Mattia Nicastri has been a test driver at Pirelli for two and a half years. The developers swear by his judgment. Humans have so many sensors in their body, and when they're trained like our driver, they deliver the best test results. Nothing has sensors as good as the human body, better than any machine. Straight from the dry road to the wet test track. Test driver Mattia immediately accelerates the sports car to around 200 kilometers per hour. Tires account for a large part of the emotional driving experience. And yet, they're neither a status symbol nor a lifestyle product. Marketing them isn't easy. But Pirelli has always been very innovative in communication. From the beginning, Pirelli has engaged outstanding artists for its advertising campaigns and thus found its very own Pirelli style. One of the cultural treasures, however, is a calendar. Supermodels and actresses were photographed for the famous Pirelli calendar. Laura Riboldi is vice director of the Pirelli Foundation. She exhibits everything to do with the company's history here. Laid end to end, the exhibits would measure three and a half kilometers. The calendar is naturally a part of the Pirelli story, too. The first calendar was published in 1964. This one here is from 1965 and is the work of Brian Duffy, the greatest photographers of their time, like Peter Lindbergh and Annie Leibovitz, have collaborated with us on the calendar. Only famous celebrities and selected business partners receive the coveted collector's item. 
Today, there are 12,000 copies to be distributed. This exclusivity and the famous names involved in its production has given it cult status. Back to the test track in Visola. Test driver Mattia propels the P0 through the slalom course. Over 5,000 test drives take place in Vizola each year. The tire seems to respond well on a wet surface. Andrea Vergani checks whether the first test runs have left any signs of wear. Mattia, how did the tests go? Good. The level of grip is very high and it responds well even in the wet. Better than the previous model? It's well balanced. We're on the right track? I really stepped on the gas. It runs really well and we're really strong compared to other tires too. Let's start the next tests. Sounds really positive. I'm satisfied. Perfect. How does the P0 behave in aquaplaning situations? If the grooves in the tread aren't perfect, the tread pattern has to be fine-tuned. Test driver Mattia attaches a GPS to the car, and outdoor test manager Enrico Di Giacomo installs a tachometer. It's actually quite a simple device. There's a sensor here that counts the number of tire revolutions over a set time. The higher the number, the faster the tire is rotating. So we have both the speed of the tire and the speed of the car is calculated by the GPS. If the tire is no longer rotating but the car is still moving forward, the tire has lost contact with the road surface. And that's exactly what happens during aquaplaning. Aquaplaning occurs if the tire is unable to displace the layer of water. What happens during the test exactly? We measure the angular velocity of the inside tire and I notice when accelerating if the steering isn't responding properly and I'm losing control over the car. Can the P0 prevent aquaplaning for as long a time as possible? Mattia heads for the test pan. 150 meters long, filled with nine millimeters of water. The tire has to expel the water through its grooves in order to maintain as much contact with the road as possible. The sophisticated tread design provides for optimal grip. I really pushed it. The tire behaves in a very safe manner even for an average driver. Mantia checks the tread pattern once again with the head of the testing department, Andrea. The new tire does in fact offer greater safety in aquaplaning situations. I hope it still works at full power too. Yes, that's our goal. We're on the right track. Good. Again, driver safety is paramount. Every tire carries a great responsibility. When I'm out, I'm always checking to see if other people's tires are okay, if they have old tires on their cars or the wrong ones for the season. We're always looking at tires. Whenever I'm stuck in traffic congestion, I take a close look at the other driver's tires. It performed well on the sports car. Now the P0 has to pass the same rigorous tests on a sedan. Back in Turin, where the P0 tires are being produced, the tires have covered a distance of around two kilometers through the factory in the process. Now, 
They've arrived at the intermediate warehouse, soon to be set free to conquer the streets of the world. Something made possible thanks to all the workers pulling together. They propose ideas for improving processes and have a hand in developing new strategies too. When it comes to the manufacturing process, we're talking about a machine that has to perform flawlessly. We've developed a model taken from Formula One called Pit Stop. This enables us to prepare for the new requirements of each make of car as quickly as possible. We got the idea from Formula One. Like during a pit stop, all of the processes are perfectly synchronized. Approximately 100 constituents, some of which you wouldn't expect to find in a tire, have to be fused together in order to eventually create a world-class tire. The P0 has completed 50 different tests, both in the laboratory and on the test track. Now it's finished, and countless cars will soon be taking to the streets, fitted with the ultra-high performance tire from Pirelli. Trucks, kings of the road with enormous power. Their manufacture demands a good eye, absolute precision, and above all, perfect logistics. The logistics part is very important. For a company like ours, it makes all the difference. It determines whether we win or lose. The most powerful engines in the industry for approximately 200 trucks each day. Each one unique built to the customer's specification in a feat of logistical perfection. Time to the minute. The Volvo FH, one of the most popular trucks in Europe, and every single one must be absolutely reliable and safe. Situated just outside the Belgian town of Ghent lies Volvo's largest truck manufacturing plant. It's the ideal location, close to thousands of customers across Western Europe. Approximately 42,000 trucks are produced here each year, including their best seller, the Volvo FH. 420 up to 750 horsepower, two up to four axles, Gross combination weight of over 70 metric tons. Price starting at 85,000 euros. The mega factory's day begins at the port of Ghent. At 6 a.m. with a daily container ship from Sweden. It delivers the most important parts for building the FH. Yannick Maas is responsible for unloading the shipment and he's under considerable time pressure. The challenge is to unload the ship and then load it again as quickly as possible. This has to be done in one shift so that the ship can set sail again on time. The containers have to be off as quickly as possible so that the parts are available at the factory on time. Things happen in rapid succession now, trailer for trailer.
Around 75 of the containers on the ship, each weighing up to 30 metric tons, are destined for the mega factory. Secured with a special anchoring system and parked as close as possible to maximize load capacity aboard ship, these need to be landed and on the road as soon as possible. They contain everything from steel girders for the chassis, axles, gearboxes, and small items, to radios, microwaves, and truck engines, all locked, loaded, and ready to continue their journey to the factory. Another key component of the Volvo FH has just arrived at the port too, this time by train. The cabs. They come from Sweden as well. The specialists in Ghent turn the raw, naked cab into a completely furnished long-haul truck cab customized according to the customer's wishes. Um, these, stickers, uh, bevaten, uh, these stickers indicate the cab model uh, and, uh, and chassis, number. chassis number. They're here on our list too. Unfortunately, they're not always loaded onto the train in the right order. For instance, 448 is here and beside it 440. So we first have to line up the cabs properly on the parking lot here so they arrive at the factory in the correct order. Everything in the factory is governed by the chassis numbers. They determine the order in which the trucks are built, which is why the raw naked cabs have to be in the right order here too. And because they're already painted, care must be taken to avoid scratching them. The forks of the forklift truck are fitted with special protective guards. This ensures they don't come into direct contact with the cabs and scratch them. The freight wagons are custom built so that the cabs fit exactly and don't get damaged during transport. There are three different cab sizes available and 650 color options. The most popular color, white. Once properly ordered, they immediately head to the factory by truck. It's vital that the cabs arrive at the factory on time. Although we have a buffer of around 40 cabs, we have to maintain a continuous supply. Otherwise, production would grind to a halt, and that would be a big problem. Agreed delivery dates could be missed which would be disastrous for customer relations and their brand image. All the components that make up the Volvo FH are now on their way to the factory. The truck plant consists of four main sections. The fitting center, a huge tire and rim warehouse, the market adaption center for the seemingly infinite customizations and special requests the cab trim, the large cab assembly building, and the vast main assembly building, the heart of the factory. The truck is assembled here in the 75,000 square meter main assembly building. At the center of the building, the twin track assembly line, 420 meters long. Piece by piece, a thousand workers assemble one of the most popular trucks in the world, the Volvo FH. It consists of three main sections. The steel chassis forms the basis. In the middle, the heart of the brake system, the air compressor. The axles are fitted to the chassis. The number depends on the customer's requirements. Then comes the mighty engine. The last major section needed to complete the truck is the cab, each one unique. Everything begins with the steel girders. 
Until recently in containers at the port, a side loader forklift now transports them into the main assembly building. A side support measures five and a half to 12 and a half meters in length, depending on the truck version. Two side supports form the subframe of the FH, the chassis. Two workers start by applying a simple white adhesive tape to the side supports. This will act as a guide. They then mount a cross support. It connects the long side supports. And now, the sticker tape comes into play. It's there so that the assembly line workers know exactly where they have to put which bolt. There are over 50 different bolts, screws, and rivets. And the side support can have up to 330 holes. Lots of room for costly error. Production manager Kuhn Lehmanns has an overview of the entire production operation. And he knows a mistake made at the beginning could have fatal consequences. What the workers do here is very important. It's the start of production. All of the downstream assembly is based on this frame. Everything done afterwards depends on the workers here correctly installing every part. A single rivet in the wrong place. And further down the assembly line, another part will no longer fit. The consequence? Production stoppage instead of a smooth mega manufacture. Up to a thousand cable ties per truck have to wrap around the right cables. Otherwise, it may be impossible to mount the engine or the cab on the chassis later on. Around 1,500 individual parts are installed in 210 operations over the next eight hours from the simple unadorned chassis to a state-of-the-art truck. Each of the trucks that rolls off the assembly line here in Ghent each day needs this part, the air pressure monitor, a piece of equipment essential for the braking system. These hoses carry the air, and because every truck is unique, a different combination of hoses are required for each model. A machine cuts a specific set for each truck from a choice of 20 kilometers of varying thickness of hose each day. They now have to be attached to the air compressor. But the variety of hose means no two fixes are the same. Keeping track here is critical, or it can be very dangerous. If you make a mistake here, a vital part of the truck won't work. This device modulates the braking force, so it's crucial that I attach everything properly. There's a code here that tells me which hose has to go where. This has to be done right. Otherwise, the control system can lock up or the brakes fail. This is the heart of the entire brake system. The air compressor is now ready to be installed in our chassis, one of approximately 42,000 each year. Installation requires absolute precision. If a hose doesn't sit properly or has a kink, it will prevent the entire truck working. done. All the small components are installed, but these steps could be carried out differently in the future. Greater efficiency, fewer sources of air. In an adjacent building, they're working on the production operation of tomorrow in the training center. The goal of these engineers, the digital factory, mega manufacturing with 3D guidance on monitors directly at the assembly line. You can see here how it's inserted. As an instruction manual, you can zoom in and check how it's done in detail. The advantage is that you can zoom out to any level. Here, for example, you can move out a level and see where the cable has to be attached. Uh, fully automatic. Yeah. 
Pascal Mersrat is Director of Engineering and Maintenance, and he wants to use this live data from the assembly line to improve workflow in real time. But that's not the most exciting bit. We call this here a virtual story. We want to use virtual reality to train the workers on new products. It gives them a better idea of what to expect. Right now, he's virtually inspecting a new truck, how it's built and what new features it has. This not only allows our engineers to familiarize themselves with the product, but more importantly, train our assembly line workers. This new technology will soon be rolled out in the main assembly area in order to build even better trucks in less time. The chassis of the FH, it's now ready for a significant moment in the mega factory. Production director Kuhn is present when the truck's frame is lifted into the air. I love this station. The chassis is now finished. Next, we turn it over and transport it to the automatic assembly line. From then on, the assembly line moves forward without stopping while we build the rest of the truck on the frame. All of the cables are now installed, and after this station here, everything on the assembly line runs at a predetermined speed without a break. This is when all of the large sections are fitted the axles, the engine, the cab. Now it's time for the big parts. Approximately 1,800 kilograms begin the next stage of their journey, positioned so that the truck's axles can be fitted. Everything is carefully coordinated in this truck mega factory. Just a few meters away, the most important part is about to enter the building. The engine, manufactured at the main plant in Sweden and painted an iconic Volvo green. With between 420 and 750 horsepower, six cylinders, which when firing can displace an eye-watering 16 liters. Next, the transmission. Clutch and alternator are fitted to the powerful engine. Now fully assembled, it can finally be installed in the chassis. There's one engine attachment that production director Kuhn is particularly fond of. This is the I-Shift, our pride and joy. A manual transmission in which various elements act in concert to make it easier to change gears. This is our special innovation, the heart of the engine, very important to us. It's a patented development inspired by the motor racing scene. Its purpose, smoother gear changes and reduced stalling. The secret of the I-Shift transmission, it has two drive shafts that are connected to the engine via two clutches. When driving, the first gear is engaged via one shaft. The other shaft already engages the second gear. This immediately becomes active when changing gear without the usual interruption. It prevents a loss of traction, a great help on hills. At the engine station in the main assembly building, the engine is waiting to be installed in the chassis. It's now lowered toward the assembly line from above. Below, the axles are already waiting to be connected to the drive shaft and then both will be attached to the chassis. From now on, the assembly line is fully automatic. The clock is always ticking. The engine has arrived, fully fitted and weighing it at 2,000 kilograms. 
This is one of the most important sequences at the plant. Everything has to fit perfectly. I guide the engine. That means I make sure it's lowered exactly into the chassis. We all have to pay attention that none of the cables get damaged in the process. It's pretty tricky. But it works. A wonderful sight for fans of pure, brute horsepower. Fantastic. We call this a marriage. We have three marriages in the factory. The axles with the chassis, the engine with the chassis, and the cab with the chassis. So this is a happy occasion for us. There are only three connections between the engine and the chassis, but that's enough. When I see one of our trucks on the road, see its engine, I say to myself, I did that, I installed that engine. It always fills me with pride when a Volvo truck drives by. It's a great job. A computer is used during the final stage of installation the so-called Mont system for fixing the engine in position, individually according to the stored chassis number. The torque settings for the connections are stored in the computer. If these values aren't achieved, things can't progress. The computer control ensures that the connection is made correctly and the customer can be satisfied. Now the chassis gets its fifth wheel. It will later connect the truck with the trailer. From here, it isn't much further until the final marriage in the factory is performed. Producing trucks on an assembly, this takes huge amounts of energy. On the outskirts of the Ghent plant, Pascal, director of engineering and maintenance, is on the roof of an adjacent building with some colleagues for an on-site meeting. Concealed from view on the roof is the source of the truck manufacturer's energy. An enormous solar plant consisting of 15,000 panels. If we want to install the panel here, let's see how it can be done. The cable comes from down here. Ah, right, from back here. Understood. The Ghent truck factory was the first carbon neutral automotive plant in the world. We use a combination of technologies. On the one hand, we have three of our own wind turbines, each generating 2 megawatt, and together producing 10,000 megawatt per year. Then there are our solar panels. We've installed 4,500 square meters of them. They produce 500 megawatt per year. This is supplemented by solar and hot water accumulators and the purchase of green electricity. Apparently, a third of the parts used to build the trucks are made from recycled materials too. And there's also a biomass plant. Truck manufacture and carbon neutrality sound like odd bedfellows, but it feels good to be able to say that we as a factory are doing something for the environment. Absolutely. Back to our truck. Before its marriage in the main building, the custom cab has to be fitted out, here at Cab Trim. 
The still bear calves, which arrived from Sweden by train just this morning, wait in front of the building. It's now time to fit them out, each totally unique and different. 300 workers in the cab trim department transformed the bare shelves into fully furnished cabs. Mats, wall panels, loudspeakers, all fitted by hand. And especially important, the bed. 74 or 88 by 200 centimeters in size. Many customers request two fold-away bunks, one above the other, as in this case. Rubber seals. How important they are for the production operation in the huge truck factory will become apparent later on. Next to the cab assembly line, a handful of workers are dealing with the truck's electrical systems. From nearly a hundred different switches and plugs, they find the right ones for each truck and assemble the instrument cluster. The steering wheel pedestal is installed now too. They check whether all the connections are correct at a test station and the instrument cluster is powered up for the first time. The area surrounding the steering wheel is especially important. The main concern is the electronics, but we check every rivet and screw and whether all the connectors are plugged in as well. Modern trucks like the FH are full of computers. There's one element that's particularly important for the steering. It's a special electric motor on the steering column of the truck. Sensors dotted around the truck and in proximity to the driver transmit information to this motor 2,000 times a second. The result? It makes maneuvering less strenuous, assists in lane keeping, compensates for strong crosswinds, and even minimizes the impact of potholes. Volvo calls this dynamic steering. Silicone adhesive is now applied to the finished instrument cluster. A special hoist arm lowers the central element of the cockpit into the cab. A few screws and it's fixed in place. It takes five and a half hours for a cab to complete its journey through the cab trim building in the truck mega factory. And no two cabs are alike. One of the 300 women in the factory works in the final third of the building. Celine Colin from Ghent loves working on trucks. When I tell people I build trucks, they're always surprised because I'm not big and strong, but rather a small girl. <laughs> but they're impressed by the fact, and that makes me feel good. The windshields, one of the few components in the mega factory installed by a robot. First, it measures the exact dimensions of the cab. Then it grabs the appropriate windshield, applies silicone, and installs it with millimeter precision. The unit cost two and a half million euros. It's important that this task is performed by the robot. We need absolute precision here. This is vital in order that the windshield sits securely and is windproof. But despite this, it doesn't always work flawlessly, as we'll soon see. Time for the seats. There are 12 different models to choose from, all designed for comfort and durability. Now comes the steering wheel, every one individually adjusted and mounted with this torque wrench. 
This is followed by the doors, side view mirrors, and labels. But the cab can't be mounted on the chassis just yet. We'll find out why in a minute. Many operations in the mega factory involve strenuous manual work, but the tasks this employee performs just using muscle power are soon to be made easier. The truck manufacturer is testing a new technology in the cab trim section, exoskeletons. I don't think this here is sitting right yet. I don't think you need to move your arm so far back. Hold it up again. Now it's activated. The mechanical lifting aid developed in the USA should lighten the load on workers. There are some tests that involve workers lifting up to and above shoulder height. The exoskeleton helps them do this. For example, when I'm attaching the roof strip and take that tool. The tool from up there. Above my shoulder. Yes. Operator Edouard Dumont gets started. The braces of the device reduce the weight of the lifted parts by almost seven kilograms. It doesn't make Edward faster, but he'll have fewer shoulder and back problems later in life. Actually, it is quite easy, but you have to get used to it. During the first three weeks, I had to make big adjustments to my work rhythm and the order of my work steps, too. A robot wouldn't help here. A robot is an option where you have to perform the same task over and over again. That can be automated, but that's difficult to do in our factory because we have far too many truck and cab variants. We need the flexibility offered by our workers. We're a factory with humans and need our operators. So I believe that an exoskeleton is better than a robot. Workers like Edward are testing the technology at five stations in the plant. If the results are positive, it could become commonplace here. Back to our cab. Like every cab in the truck factory, custom built according to the customer's wishes. Emre Tamis checks whether all the optional extras are installed. There's a microwave installed in this truck. This is practical for the driver. He can use it to warm up or defrost things. The microwave has an LED light, three power settings, and a defrost function. It has a 17-liter capacity. And down here, we have a 33-liter fridge. It can also be used as a freezer. The seat here has air suspension. You can adjust it to any height, which I think is a good feature, as you don't feel the potholes and bumps as much. There's a touch screen with navigation system and popular apps like the Dynafleet system. This allows the driver to monitor all his trips and activities and store them for two years. If I were a truck driver, I'd feel really comfortable here. There's plenty of space, you can stand upright, the bed is great, and there's loads of space to store things like clothing and food. There's more storage space up here too. And there's a mirror for putting on makeup or shaving. You can do everything in here. This custom mass production operation is made possible thanks to a sophisticated logistics system. But something is still missing. The cab is now fully assembled, and it could now move on to final assembly. But this one is going to be subjected to a water test. Sam here will take it over to the water testing bay and check if there are any leaks. The cabs are chosen at random, and team leader Gunther de Klerk is a little nervous before each of these tests. 
We occasionally have problems with the robots resulting in a leaky windshield or roof hat. Roof antennas, which don't sit securely enough and allow water to get in, can be a problem too. Fingers crossed, that shouldn't happen normally. If the cab has a leak, they have to test the 10 preceding and the 10 following cabs too. This slows down production in the entire factory significantly. A 15-minute drenching, then it moves to the yard to be manually inspected with a flashlight. If tester Ken Fang Holuva discovers even a small puddle, production will be halted. But everything's fine this time. The hope for stamp of approval. The cab is okay, no leaks. It can now be brought over to final assembly. They assemble approximately 200 cabs per day, depending on the order book. Ours is now ready to be mounted on its chassis in the main assembly building. The heart of the truck factory. Our chassis, together with its engine, is now heading toward the climax of the production operation, the cab drop. Thirteen hundred kilograms approach the chassis, centimeter by centimeter. Everything has to fit perfectly. The next cab will arrive in five minutes. Full concentration is required. Two bolted joints at the back and two at the front. Then the marriage is over and the next one begins immediately afterwards. Our cab is lowered onto our chassis. Every time we have visitors to the plant and we watch a cab drop, they say, now that's a truck. It's a really important station for us when the cabs join the chassis. It's now recognizable as a truck. Following the marriage, the truck is nearly finished. But something is still missing. Something from the fitting center. The truck plant's huge tire warehouse in Ghent. One of the biggest in Europe. Over 550 tread patterns and around 12,500 tires covering an area of 13,000 square meters. A suitable tire to meet every customer requirement and the matching rims too. There are a hundred types of rims alone. Special robots mount the tires on the rims, 167 an hour. It takes 63 seconds for each one faster than a human could do it. From here, the tires now head to our truck in the main assembly building. A large five-way torque gun tightens all the lug nuts at the same time. This saves time and ensures that no nuts get forgotten. The diesel tanks can hold up to 900 liters of fuel and every customer gets to choose the right one for his truck. Filling with diesel, oil, and add blue, the final operation in the assembly build. One of approximately 42,000 trucks each year is now heading for the finishing line in the Ghent Mega Factory. It's a very important station. Here, all of the hoses are pressurized for the first time and the power steering is tightened. This is the crucial moment when it will become apparent whether there are any leaks in the lines. 
This is an important test after filling the tank. If the truck can then drive off the line, we can have a big celebration. Production director Kuhn wants to start up our truck personally. Super, Super perfect. perfect, a good truck. One like this rolls off the production line every 10 minutes. It's taken eight hours to build the FH. Starting with the chassis, with all the cables, hoses, and air pressure regulator. Then the axles, the drive shaft, followed by the engine with the smooth I-shift dual clutch transmission. And finally, the cab with the electric motor for the dynamic steering system. And one of Europe's most popular trucks is complete. But not every fully assembled truck is exactly how the customer wants it. That's where the Mega Manufacturer's Market Adaption Center comes in, fulfilling special requests. Specialists like Daniel de Koenig are responsible for this, and the most frequent requested, cosmetic changes. Remove the PA-15. It's to be painted in color 98717, then PA-20 to 60 in color 2705. The customer wants to have specific parts of the vehicle in other colors. So Daniel's colleagues dismantle the finished truck once again. Time consuming, but indeed simpler than changing the production workflow in the main assembly building. Meanwhile, line manager Daniel has to visit the paint mixing room. The cab of another truck has to be completely repainted. Good morning. Morning, how's everyone doing? Didier. Can you finish mixing the color so we can paint the cab, please? The precise mixing ratio is stored in the computer. Almost 900 colors are in stock, making countless hues and variations possible, including loud ones. We once had a customer who wanted everything in pink. Chassis in pink, cab in pink, all the plastic parts in pink. This was our pink lady, something I'll not forget in a hurry. The desired shade of black is mixed. Five liters are sufficient to paint a cap. The spray job is done manually by small teams of workers. In the three paint booths, they can repaint practically everything on the truck according to the customer's wishes, even the entire chassis, if the customer so desires. In a few hours, the yellow cab will look like this one here. Black is popular, but line manager Daniel says colorful is making a comeback. More and more customers nowadays want parts of the truck in different colors. This in yellow, this in red, this in blue. We're sometimes rather surprised about the combination of colors. But their motto is anything is possible. Back from the market adaption center to main assembly, our truck still isn't ready for delivery. What happens following production is as important as the assembly itself, a thorough test. The truck will now be put through its paces in the testing bay. The dyno. Acceleration. Braking power. Lights. Tester Christophe Tremery logs into a computer that's programmed with a test procedure for every truck. Windshield wipers. Indicators, headlights, horn, and the best is yet to come. 
The bit I enjoy most is driving and accelerating. When I started, it was difficult to keep the truck centered, but after a few weeks, I knew the ropes. Does he still start off carefully and stay in the lane? First at 30 kph instead of 80 to warm up. Then Christoph steps on the gas. Will the truck perform as expected? Not far from the dyno at the end of the main assembly building, there's another building for testing the trucks with another focus, the audit. He is one of the factory's elite testers, David Peens, 35 years old and at Volvo for 12 years. 2% of the trucks have to undergo an intensive test with him. This time, it's the FH16, the premium model. David's eagle eyes spot something that isn't so premium. There's a scratch on the indicator here. When I take the glove off, I can feel it. I have to report it so it can be replaced. Hardly detectable, even for the camera. But David isn't just concerned with the visual appearance. He will be the first to drive the truck out of the factory. <laughs> 750 horsepower on its maiden trip. On public roads under realistic driving conditions. In order to test things that can't be tested on the dyno. Now at this moment can you see the red light at the front there is the collision warning system. If you drive too close, the red light comes on. You can set the distance and decide whether you'd rather be closer or further away. The collision warning and lane keeping systems, these are the two most important things I test. I also listen to whether the engine is making unusual noises or anything in the cab is rattling. David steps on the gas. He has, without doubt, one of the most sought after jobs in the factory. For me, it's a childhood dream come true. When I started at the factory, I kept hearing about the test department and what they do here. I wanted to do that too. And now my dreams come true. I'm really happy in my job. Test driver David drives for 50 kilometers. Aside from the scratch on the indicator, the truck is flawless. Back to the dyno, the test track in the main building. Tester Christoph brings the FH up to full speed. Can it reach the required 80 kilometers per hour? Yes, it can. This truck can get up to 90. Others can go as fast as 100 or 120. Because every truck leaving this factory is different. Mega manufacturing individually tailored to customer requirements. Test complete and passed. The time has come. Our Volvo FH is ready to be handed over to the customer. Like approximately 200 others today, 
all ready to fulfill their calling as powerful transport machines somewhere on the roads of Europe. They are all built in the Belgian town of Ghent. At a mega manufacturer, one of the largest truck plants in the world. The Porsche Macan, a compact SUV combining off-road qualities and everyday versatility with the DNA of a sports car. In this plant, 4,300 employees produce over 90,000 Macan vehicles per year. Every single vehicle absolutely individual and bespoke manufactured to order. A masterpiece of logistics and engineering design. It's mega manufacturing with ultimate passion and absolute precision. The Porsche Macan, the most successful horse in the stable of this legendary sports car manufacturer. The Macan is available starting at around 60,000 euros. With several extras, however, the price tag quickly grows to more than 100,000. In the turbo version, the Macan boasts 440 horsepower. Acceleration from zero to 100 kilometers per hour in only 4.5 seconds. Its top speed is around 270 kilometers per hour. The Macan is built near Leipzig in eastern Germany. Production is divided up into three halls on more than 145,000 square meters. In the body shop, the paint shop, and in final assembly, but this is where it all begins, in the body shop. The birthplace of the Porsche Macan. On more than 35,000 square meters, robots and people turn pure sheet metal into subframes around the clock. The robots are in 10 parallel production lines. They can change their tool heads within seconds, inserting various screws, or placing welding points, adapting on the spot to the demands of the car and customer. Eight hours is all they need for the entire production of a fully galvanized aluminum steel car body. Production manager Henning Steinborn is responsible for ensuring that everything runs smoothly here. The major challenge, perfectly aligning all the different elements, engineering, people and material. Ensuring there's a perfect balance between quality and unit quantities. Retaining their outstanding quality and delivering volume, a balancing act for premium manufacturers like Porsche. Here we have 400 robots altogether. Every day they make 400 car bodies out of 400 individual parts. The whole thing doesn't work without employees. We have 400 employees who, working throughout a 24-hour day, keep body manufacturing up and running. The subframe of the Porsche Macan originates in the body manufacturing department. Everything begins with the fabrication of the underbody. Then comes the side sections, as well as the top, mostly with a large panoramic sunroof. Finally, this is followed by attached parts, such as the hood, doors, and tailgates. All sheet metal parts for the car body come to Leipzig from different pressing plants. Here, so-called route trains bring the raw components to the assembly stations. The tractor trucks shine blue cones ahead of them to warn other vehicles against collisions. Because it's always rush hour in the production hall. All assembly lines must be supplied just in time when the component is required. 
The aluminum hoods weigh a mere 17 kilograms. They require special handling before later being installed in the car body. It's unprecedented in automobile engineering that we put so much work here into a single component. Nearly a half hour per hood due to the complexity of the component and its component geometry. You can see that it's physically very demanding, requires lots of dexterity and vast experience. Deburring, grinding, sanding and polishing. Anything that does not fit here down to the millimeter may later delay installation and slow down production. The processed hoods are taken over by the robot and automatically brought to the assembly station. At the same time on the next line, here robots assemble the underbody made of steel parts. A perfectly synchronized spectacle with the precision of a clockwork and perpetual motion. The robots sometimes perform two or three jobs in a row, swapping tools, providing for complete component handling, gluing applications and welding. An example of why there are only machines and no people working here? A pair of welding tongues alone weighs roughly 280 kilograms, so it could not even be held by one person. Not to mention the fact that the same welding points have to be placed in exactly the same spot throughout the day. The human colleagues support the machines in the body shop. In regular intervals, they have to feed the robots with screws so that they can complete their precision work. Car body assembly begins with the inner and outer side walls. A robot provides the blank, and a second one applies the special adhesive. Then, the robot inserts the side walls onto the car body. Only now will it undergo the final welding. The so-called framer ensures the precise geometry of the car body. The subframe of the 4.86 meter long and 1.93 wide Macan is now permanently fastened into place, and the iconic silhouette begins to take shape. Incidentally, it is based on the Audi Q5 the mid-size SUV of the company within the corporate group. The robots spot weld up to 5,300 welding points per Macan body. That is over 470 million welding points per year, and each individual point has to be exactly in the right place. No tolerance for variances. Then come the roofs. Buyers have a choice of eight different roof variants in total and customization plays an even bigger role when it comes to other features later on. In the end, a photo scanner examines the exact workmanship and once again checks all the connection points. The body shell of the Porsche Macan, it now consists of the underbody and platform. The only thing missing now are the various attached parts. The car bodies advance onto the final assembly line via a sophisticated conveyor belt system. Each Macan covers a distance of more than five kilometers on the assembly line before it even has wheels. And while the vehicle is still traveling at a walking pace through the assembly hall, out on the road, a Finnish Porsche Macan can travel at speeds of up to 270 kilometers per hour. Christina Link is responsible for the installation of attached parts. Her production line runs in three shifts, six days a week. 
Here, the doors are custom fitted onto the vehicle and automatically bolted down afterwards. The complete bolting specifications on the vehicle are stored for eternity so that we have a document of how precisely this door was bolted onto the vehicle. Those are the last steps, the automated steps in car body manufacturing. The pre-assembled steel doors of the Porsche Macan, in an unfinished state, they only weigh 13 kilograms. After final assembly, fitted with interior components, cladding and upholstery, they become twice as heavy. Since the opening of the Leipzig factory, Porsche has invested over 1.3 billion euros in this facility, and it is always constantly expanding thanks to the successful Macan model. The sale value of all Macan produced here, several billion euros. The assembly lines are not allowed to come to a standstill under any circumstances, which makes it all the more important to have reliable robots that work as maintenance-free as possible. And what's more, feature low power consumption. Thomas Riediger, head of planning, has programmed the 400-strong robot army for economy. Thanks to an intelligent controller, we are capable of accelerating the robots only to a level that is absolutely necessary. We save energy accordingly when accelerating and braking. If you consider that there are more than 400 robots installed here, and if we can save just roughly 10% on each one, then that's a really good contribution. Energy is saved in the halls through efficient robotic use and produced on the rooftops from natural solar energy. The photovoltaic system consists of more than 17,500 modules. The collectors generate 5,000 megawatt hours per year, with that amount of power, an electrically driven Porsche could travel some 5 million kilometers. Immediately behind the assembly halls and the company's own circular track, there is an entirely different world. Here, Porsche has created ecological compensation areas for the sealed ground space. Ines Besko is responsible for the natural landscape. Now the gate is opening up to our miniature Jurassic Park, as I like to refer to it. Also behind the gate is the beginning of a six kilometer long off-road track. Here, Porsche customers and test drivers can explore the limits of their SUVs. So when you're out on this 132 hectare off-road track, you always see lots of wild animals. For example, we have deer here, we have fallow deer, we have field bunnies, partridges. We have an incredible diversity of species here that we would like to preserve and care for in this project. This is where 245 horsepower encounters the original horsepower, 25 Exmoor ponies, and 75 aurochs graze on this managed ecosystem. Here on the off-road track, in a special area, our customers can experience the vehicle they pick up here. At the same time, we care for the natural habitat, this open countryside. It's our contribution to biodiversity. And occasionally, an aurochs also lands in the Porsche cafeteria as a sustainable steak. But more on that later. First, we want to return to the car body assembly hall for the Macan. The last work steps still need to be completed there. Workers mount the tailgates and several smaller attached parts. For these final stages, they have replaced the ubiquitous robots. Yet, they still work with the same precision on the skeleton of the most successful horse in the Porsche stable. The completed Macan car body now weighs nearly one half of a metric ton. 480 kilograms of steel and aluminum just waiting to be custom painted and to make their way towards final assembly. But first, quality control. 
Each individual Macan car body is checked with utmost precision. Shift Supervisor Antonio Calaconde is responsible for ensuring that all car bodies are immaculate. Yes, we can compare this to a pit stop. The vehicles drive here as if they were on a racetrack. Employees inspect the surfaces, the gaps, and prepare the vehicles properly so that we can hand them off in 150 seconds and send them to the painting facility. Here comes the countdown. The specialists have two and a half minutes to correct small deviations using a hammer, a sander, and a screwdriver. This individual quality control is unique in mass production and for Porsche, an absolute necessity. As we can see, an employee carefully inspects at least 140 vehicles per shift by hand. He checks for any possible damage or scratches to the surface. If a Macan does not pass this test, it is taken out of the line and required to go back for reworking. Afterwards, it is reintroduced onto the line and required to go through quality control again. But that should not happen very often because the time to complete a Macan is very tight in order to meet customer demands. After successfully passing quality control, the Macan car bodies advance to the paint shop in the next hall. But first, it's time to make a quick stop in one of three cafeterias. It is connected to the final assembly hall, where most of the employees work on the assembly line and take a break starting from 11.30 a.m. The preparations for lunch are in full swing. During lunchtime and in the evening, the 4,300 employees can choose among various meals. The just-in-time principle applies here as well. Head chef Norbert Ritzmann ensures that everything is served fresh, hot, and above all, on time. In addition to the daily menu at a special price, there are three other main dishes to choose from, along with various side dishes, desserts, and salads. At 11.30 a.m., the time has come. This is when the first huge rush on the cafeteria takes place, because now the workers from the early shift have half an hour to eat. The greatest challenge each day is we begin at zero. We offer different entrees every day. At 11.30 a.m., employees come from the assembly line wanting a hot meal. We know that within roughly eight to 10 minutes, 150 employees will come in wanting well-cooked food. They don't like it to be tough. The French fries ought to be crisp. So this just-in-time concept is very important to us. The workers need to eat in a hurry. Some of them need several minutes to get from their location on the assembly line to the cafeteria. Typical German efficiency. The daily menu is available for three euros 90, including a side dish. Today, meatloaf. The most popular meals, believe it or not, are always hearty foods like hamburgers and french fries. Currywurst, 180 grams with french fries, nice and hearty, even a normal schnitzel, breaded, is a leading favorite, or doner kebab. So there too, we always have a larger food percentage of 20 to 25 percent. By 2 p.m. at the latest, the rush subsides. That is when all employees need to be back at their workstations on the assembly line or in the office. In the car body hall, for example, where audits take place three times a day, they entail very detailed quality controls. In each shift, one car body is removed from the production line and a specialist goes over it with a fine tooth comb. There is no time pressure involved here, only a keen eye and an intuition for detail. 
A special sense of touch is naturally the most important skill of all. We auditors have that special instinctive feel in our hands, which you need in order to filter out waviness and uneven surfaces. Once the auditor has completed his evaluation, he presents the results to the colleagues from the various manufacturing departments. If there are production-related defects, these need to be identified and eliminated in order to uphold the high-quality standards. Otherwise, the rear trunk flap is without any defects, except for the small sanded area that I would write down as a remark, the corner area. A keen eye for the most minute details, despite the high production volume. True modern mega manufacturing. The next production step awaits the completed car bodies. They come into the paint shop. On a total space of 60,000 square meters, the newborn naked macans receive their final color. And that is a complicated process. The first step, a special cleaning procedure for the body shells. Lab technician Simona Clemens is responsible for ensuring that the paint on the vehicles will later have an immaculate shine. The body shells come to us from the body construction facility and are chemically pre-treated in order to ensure optimal cleaning of the car bodies from grease, dirt, aluminum residues, and prepared for the next steps. We have special specifications from chemical manufacturers, and these key parameters must be met by adjusting the dosage of chemicals using more or less. The cleaning solution needs to be mixed perfectly. If the dosage isn't precise, the tiniest contaminants on the car bodies could later lead to ugly flaws in the all-important paintwork. Following chemical cleaning is a very special immersion bath. In this tank, the vehicle frame receives special corrosion protection. In the immersion bath, there is a special electro deposition coating and completely desalinated water with a temperature of 33 degrees Celsius. Between the tank walls and the car body, an electric current of 380 volts is applied, initiating an electrochemical process. As a result, the positively charged paint particles are automatically attracted to the negatively charged Macan car body. The result of the cathodic electrodeposition, an extremely uniform coating of cavities and metal surfaces. After the electrodeposition coating, the car bodies dry at 175 degrees Celsius for 50 minutes. Then they are ready for the next step, the sealing of the welds. Robots in splash guard covers apply sealant to the welds using separately calibrated nozzles. In addition, they seal the underbody in order to protect it against impact from stones. The process engineer, Natalie Matekau, monitors this important process directly prior to final coating. At Porsche, we work with low-density PVC material. It has the advantage that we can apply the same volume, yet lower weight to the car body, which is relevant especially in the sports car segment. Between 6 and 8 kilograms of PVC are applied to a single car body. In the process, the sealing joints need to have perfect coverage in order to prevent moisture from later penetrating the car body. In order to check how our welds will look on the finished vehicle, we produce so-called splash guards. In this process, the robot applies a weld to a sheet metal part, and we are able to compare the welds one-to-one, -one. can take a look at the surface, the joint to the base material, and the weld width. In this case, it's looking very good. Thanks to two different nozzles, the robots can treat both narrow seams and impregnate surface areas. Once the underbody protection is dried, it is finally time to advance to the actual painting. Absolute cleanliness is the highest priority. Not a single speck of dust or a single particle of lint is allowed to come between the prime car body and the final coat of paint. Otherwise, paint flaws may occur. And, in the worst case, individual body parts would have to be repainted. 
That is why every square centimeter is polished. Now robots are applying the so-called filler paint. Its color is geared to the final paint coating of the car. White for light exterior colors, anthracite for dark exterior colors, and medium gray for the color hues in between. The filler balances out any remaining uneven surfaces in the car body and has UV protective characteristics. It also enhances the brilliance of the paint finish. The filler needs to dry for 40 minutes. Then the Macan is ready for its final color. There are a total of 16 standard colors to choose from. Benedict Krug is a process engineer and checks the sophisticated painting procedures. Here you see the pass that the robot completes on the Macan engine hood. In terms of color, you can see the brush parameters that are programmed. In case of process fluctuations, we can intervene here in order to modify the paint quantities, speeds, or paths. Red Macan, by the way, tend to be the exception. The most popular colors are white, black, and anthracite. For an extra charge, every conceivable individual color tone can be blended upon customer request. There are also regional differences in paint preferences. Here you see one of the most popular color tones on the Chinese market, mahogany brown metallic. And here on the high rotation atomizer, the paint is atomized into the tiniest particles using this bell. The bell spins at 40 to 60,000 RPM, generating very fine paint particles, and these paint particles are wonderfully distributed over the entire car body. The paint on a Porsche Macan is applied in four layers. In the end, it is 0.13 millimeters thick. That is almost as thick as a human hair. No human being would be capable of applying the paint as evenly as a paint spraying robot. The entire painting process requires some 15 hours per vehicle, including drying intervals. Because we run a just-in-time production, the sequence in which we complete the paint process is irrelevant. We can paint in red, followed by blue, then immediately in black. In between each car body, the atomizer nozzles are rinsed and the paint changer is located in the front section of the arm. We use the paint changer to switch the new color to be sprayed. The paint loss that we have is minimal. Then comes the next highlight, the final surface inspection. Karsten Lippmann checks in the light tunnel to ensure that each paint coat is applied flawlessly to the Macan car body. With these LEDs and these mirrors, structured light is projected onto the body. This helps us to detect even the tiniest faults in the paint coating. Should there be any visible defects, they go through ultra-fine sanding and are polished to a high-gloss finish. The specialists in the light tunnel have exactly three minutes to review the work in detail and ensure Porsche's quality control standards are met. This also includes initial remedial measures in case of the tiniest irregularities in the surface. Good eyes are indispensable here. It probably looks somewhat strange for us to be hammering around on a freshly painted car. My colleague just discovered a small uneven surface in the roof, and now he's going to be working on it with a hammer. Afterwards, the surface will once again be 100% smooth and the vehicle will be ready for sale. Other manufacturers do not allow themselves this luxury of genuine craftsmanship for paint inspection. But Porsche holds itself to different standards, even when delivering more than 90,000 vehicles per year. After painting is complete, it's time for final assembly. Final assembly takes place in the factory's third and largest hall, 
on a total of 60,000 square meters, the painted car body is fitted out to a complete car. Via conveyor belts, the painted car bodies advance into the final assembly hall. Here, they receive the all-important customer interface, the interior fittings, and all conceivable extra features according to customer preferences. This is where customer preference begins to determine the final product and whether their Macan will ultimately cost 60,000 euros or more than 100,000 euros. Final assembly is monitored by Ulf Richter. He is responsible for ensuring that each and every Macan rolls off the assembly line just in time. The technician has a work area that the vehicle passes through in two minutes. We speak of a so-called tact time. This means that our customer cycle, two minutes, is a function of the number of vehicles that we are scheduled to build in the work time available. We work in two shifts, and the shift change occurs while the line is moving. At 3 p.m., the colleagues all change shifts, which means that actually we are constantly in vehicle production mode. This means 1,300 assembly workers each have two minutes to complete their individual specialized tasks. Surprisingly, the first step of final assembly involves disassembly. The doors are removed again. They are fitted out on a separate door assembly line. By the time all individual parts and the windows are installed, each door gains up to 20 kilograms of additional weight, depending upon the features and materials of the interior trim. An important side effect of separate door assembly. This means the interior spaces in the still exposed car body are more readily accessible to their colleagues. Much still has to be done. Depending upon customer preference, the workers still have to install up to 5,000 different individual parts. For each individual step, there is a special team, each having only two minutes. The workers move on an assembly line along with the car body. Once they have completed their work step, they walk back and start the process over again on the next car. One of the key installation components is the cable harness. Here, all the electrical lines in the Porsche Macan are pre-assembled and bundled. They have a total length of up to three kilometers. In this area, the cable harnesses are installed. One of the 5,000 parts that go into the vehicle during the assembly line cycle. Perhaps a conspicuous feature is that we have very few robots here. This is due to the variety. This can be more effectively achieved by employees. The variety of the parts and the customization concept, it requires special logistics. Because every Porsche Macan is unique and produced according to customer request only. That is why only very broad plans can be made in advance as to which part is going to be needed and in which quantities. A logistical challenge of the highest order. All day long, trucks arrive at the loading dock of the assembly hall, bringing parts for the interior trim, manufactured by suppliers according to Porsche specifications. Every few minutes, another truck arrives. The workers in the logistics center unload. This makes even Tetris seem straightforward. Christoph Friedman ensures that all the parts land in the right place at the right time. We consciously do not refer to this as our warehouse because we don't have traditional warehousing of parts carried out over days or weeks. Instead, this area is for making parts available to our colleagues on the assembly line as needed so that they can be installed accordingly on the date of installation. Here in the logistics department, we work with roughly 800 suppliers who supply us every day with the parts that we need in production and assembly. Here, for example, we have a bin containing covers delivered this morning. Over the next 24 to 48 hours, we will be installing these components. 
an amazing logistical feat. The latest breakthrough, a fully automated high bay warehouse, all developed by the in-house team. Here, critical small parts can be kept in temporary storage and called up at any time. Bastian Müller was involved in the development of this warehousing concept. He knows the inner workings of the fully encapsulated high bay rack system like no other. In our warehouse, we have a chaotic storage system, which means that the material is distributed among various places. As a result, we can still obtain material if there is a disturbance in one part of the plant. Thanks to the warehousing administration software, we can swap out the material to various places. Manage chaos. This motto enables Porsche to make maximum use of the storage room by each robot knowing precisely where each part was stored. Thanks to chips and barcodes and sophisticated robotic software, this is possible. The third colleague in the logistics crew is Nick McCann. He oversees the vast warehouse racks and the distribution of their contents to the correct final destination down in the assembly hall. In order to save space, we are running a system of dynamic order picking. Dynamic order picking makes only the components available in the commissioning zone that are actually required for the next four or five vehicles. All other components are positioned above the storage rack using a rack retrieval device, so that when the component is actually required, it is moved to the lower zone and made available to the order picking technician. In concrete terms, this means orders come automatically from the assembly line to the order picking storage rack. Wherever a green lamp is lit, an employee is required to remove a part and put it into his trolley. As soon as all ordered parts are on the trolley for the trip, it drives directly to the assembly line. Because we assemble each vehicle according to customer specifications, we have a huge variety of components in our logistics department. This seat belt alone has 150 versions that we handle here. In order to allow the employee on the assembly line to concentrate exclusively on the good quality of the vehicles, in logistics we use a system that enables us to fit out vehicle-specific trolleys and send these directly to the worker. In doing so, we use the so-called pick-by-light system. The system ensures that the employee only uses the components that he actually needs. At the other end of the hall, a delivery of cockpits has just arrived. They are largely pre-assembled and ready for installation. Christoph Friedman checks several times daily to ensure the proper delivery of the key parts. The truck has just unloaded these cockpit modules. 50 of our 800 suppliers make just-in-time deliveries to us, which means that these cockpit modules are configured vehicle-specific. No two cockpits are alike. There are different leathers, different surface finishes. These modules are delivered here approximately three to four hours prior to being installed. The consequence? If a supplier truck with a shipment of cockpits is stuck in traffic for more than four hours, several Macan need to be set aside in the assembly line. The final stage until installation is very brief, however. These assembly-ready cockpits do not need to travel even 100 meters in the hall. Here we see the cockpit installation work step. For this job, we have a handling device, a so-called manipulator. It is necessary due to the weight of the cockpit. It is pivoted into the vehicle, marking off installation sites so that we can find the exact position. The cockpits are vehicle-specific, which means that they conform to the exact preferences of the customer exactly how they ordered it. Finish features. Accordingly, this affects the weight of a cockpit. It weighs between 50 and 90 kilograms without the steering wheel. 
Incidentally, among the most popular special features in the interior of the Macan are leather seats and entertainment systems. With extras like these, the final price quickly increases to over 90,000 euros. There is a special feature in the underbody final assembly. Each Macan is turned 90 degrees along its longitudinal axis. This enables workers to stand upright and work ergonomically. When they are finished with their job, the car automatically tilts back into its original position. Now the all-important engine still needs to be installed. There is a four-cylinder, 245 horsepower engine or a six-cylinder, 354 horsepower engine in the S version. And as a turbo model, the Macan even comes with 440 horsepower under the hood. For most Porsche customers, the engine is thought to be the vehicle's most important feature. It is produced in a plant belonging to the corporation in Hungary and along with a dual-clutch transmission delivered to Leipzig. A very special moment is reached when the engine and the transmission are joined to become one drive unit. The most popular engine on the Macan is the six-cylinder version because it's just got more feeling to it and because it offers enough power in reserve. Here we are in the engine pre-assembly area. This is where the transmission and the engine are mated and forming the heart of each Porsche. Prior to installation into the Macan, the engine transmission unit is fitted out in Leipzig. The generator, starter, catalytic converter, and particle filter are installed in the machine. Then comes the first high point of final assembly, the so-called engagement. In the process, the fitted engine transmission unit is placed onto the front axle of the future Macan and bolted together by experienced mechanics. At the same time, beneath the hall ceiling, the almost completely mounted car bodies float in from final assembly. It won't be long now. The marriage of the car body, engine, and chassis. So here we are in the heart of the assembly line, the quickest marriage chapel in Germany. This is where the vehicle, the car body, is married to the axles and the engine. 30 marriages occur per hour, which means that a vehicle is married every two minutes. The actual act doesn't involve much celebration. They have to make do with a few robots as best man and bridesmaid. They move the drivetrain with precision accuracy beneath the car body which is then also lowered automatically. Afterwards, several workers connect cables and lines and fasten the tailpipes into place. That's how it looks, mass production of a premium car, perfected and automated down to the most intricate detail. The logo and the legend ensure that the soul is sated. On the final stretch, the seats still need to be installed into the Macan with the help of a handling device. 89% of all customers order leather seats, by the way. Shortly before the finale, the wheels are delivered, pre-mounted, tires on rims. The rims measure up to 21 inches in diameter, and nearly all models come in an extra wide version. Now come the very last touches and symbolic finishing.
Then the work is complete. A brand new Porsche Macan rolls off the assembly line, or rather, it hovers off the assembly line. Now, all it has to do is pass the final inspection. Here, our vehicles are standing on their own wheels for the first time. Essentially, this is where we begin putting the vehicle through the acid test. The control devices are evaluated and fed with data. The axle is configured and the vehicle is put into operation. Slightly more than 24 hours have passed since the initial parts of the Macan body were conjoined. And then, the new Porsche Macan is ready for its maiden trip. It is one of more than 500 cars rolling off the assembly line in the Leipzig factory today. Sale price, 97,455 euros, including all special features the customer wanted. Porsche test driver Mike Verberger will now steer the car onto the factory's own test track. This is no time for an electrical system to fail, for a screw to be loose, or for any strange noises in the unmistakable growl of the Porsche engine. All my senses are on high alert and I pay special attention to my ears in order to simply identify any strange background noises. I also pay attention to vibrations. The factory driver tests the hill climb assist and the automatic brake for downhill driving. In order to do this job, you ought to have a technical understanding of the vehicle to analyze where possible disturbance factors could crop up and what the reason for them could be. At Porsche, each individual vehicle is test-driven by a professional. Over 500 cars per day. Not many manufacturers go to such lengths. My buddies are totally jealous of the fact that I have such a cool job and drive a Porsche every day. But a test drive is only allowed to reach 1.6 kilometers on the odometer. A Macan is delivered by then, at the latest. Everything is fine with this vehicle. Crafted from 5,500 parts in less than two days. From mechanical robots in perfect synchronicity to the experienced touch of the human hand with utmost precision and absolute passion. Those who wish to do so can pick up their Porsche Macan personally in Leipzig. In the pit lane of the customer center, the new cars await their owners. This vehicle costs more than 120,000 euros. And the next generation of successful SUVs will be completely electric.